Good evening, everyone. We'll call the meeting to order. Thank you for coming to our June Planning Advisory Committee meeting. It's nice to see such a good number of folks out, so it must mean you're interested in your neighborhood. So we'll carry on with our business, and uh, thanks for your attendance. So without further ado, I'll ask if there's any disclosures of pecuniary interest or the general nature there regarding any of the items tonight uh, for, for the committee. Seeing none, we'll move on to the approval of the agenda as presented. Motion to Council McHugh. Mr. Edison, any questions, comments? All in favor? Carried. Now I ask for a motion to approve the uh, minutes of the uh, May the 18th Planning Advisory Committee meeting and, uh, and, and uh, ask, answer any questions or business that might arise from them. Um, Councilor Kosovis, uh, JD Brown, any errors, omissions, or questions regarding those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Carry, thank you. The public meetings prescribed under the Planning Act uh, are conducted and prescribed by Section 3413 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990, as amended for one official plan amendment application affecting lands in the Trenton Ward. The meetings will be conducted in a flat manner for each application. First, I'll identify the application being considered. Then I'll ask planning staff to outline the application being considered. Then ask if there are any members of the public who have been re have registered in advance to attend and participate in the meeting and have any questions or comments regarding the, the application. If there are no public comments or questions, I will ask the committee if they have any questions or comments. Once the committee and questions have been addressed, the committee will consider and vote on the application. If you wish to provide comments, please state your name and address for the record prior to addressing the committee. This committee has been a delegated the responsibility to conduct public meetings as prescribed under the Planning Act. A full report of the meeting's proceedings will be submitted to City Council on Wednesday, July the 12th, 2023. Council will make the decision on the stated application. Anyone other than the applicant who wishes to receive further notice of Council's decision on the application must submit a written request for notice of Council's decision to the Director of Planning and Development Services. I'll now ask the Director of Planning and Development Services to please advise, to, please to advise the committee on how notice of these meetings were given. Brian, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, notice of the application being considered this evening was given in keeping with the Planning Act, RSO 1990 is amended by first class mail on May the 26th, 2023, and posting of sign on the subject property on the same date. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move right into the first public meeting of the evening, and it's staff report 7.1, and uh, or item 7.1, staff report 23-03 PD, uh, the and it's a for official plan amendment. The owner is 8411379 Canada Inc. Agent is Andrew Furnichick, WND Associates, and the location is 41, 47, and 57 Stella Crescent. The file number is D09 slash S05 slash 23. Uh, Brian, would you like to uh, address this application, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will. Um, uh, this evening's uh, meeting, is, as the committee know from the, uh, the agenda package, is a, a public meeting under the Planning Act. Um, there is no staff recommendation um, on the uh, staff report at this point in time. Uh, the objective of this evening's meeting is to provide information um, on the, the proposal, on the application, and to uh, provide the committee with, with all of the details and uh, uh, provide an opportunity for uh, input. Um, I'll relate to some of the input that we've received through the, the circulation process, and then an opportunity for members of the public to, uh, uh, they're in attendance this evening, um, to, to speak to the, the proposal. Um, after that, then we will bring back a, a full recommendation report uh, at a further meeting of, of planning committee. So as you stated, the application uh, in front of committee this evening is public information, is uh, official plan amendment application, uh, addresses 41 to 57 Stella Crescent. I will say I will speak predominantly to the uh, the purpose and objectives of the application from a planning perspective. I won't l get into too much detail on the specifics of the application uh, for the reason that we do have the, the proponent and their consultants here this evening, and I know that they have prepared a presentation, so I won't, don't want to double up on the information. So I'll relate it to the, the, the municipality side of things. 
so as I said, official plan amendment, uh, 41 to 57 Stella Crescent. Uh, part of the property is, uh, is currently vacant. It did previously hold a, a couple of uh, single family detached dwellings. Uh, the predominant piece of the, of the, uh, the parcel um, currently houses the banqueting hall, uh, known as Heroes Landing, and the associated accesses and uh, surface parking. It's a, effectively the, the Heroes Landing site is a T-shaped property coming off of Stella Crescent, and uh, that's added together with the vacant piece uh, directly adjacent to the to the west. Uh, the proposal in front of the, the committee, the, the reason or the rationale for the official plan amendment uh, is to de redesignate this parcel of land or these two combined pieces of land um, under a site-specific special policy area uh, to permit the development of a, an apartment development. Um, the application is based on 140 uh, residential apartments uh, with uh, an overall uh, uh, height of eight storeys uh, to the, the, the final building. Uh, the application's been submitted with a range of supporting studies, all of which are in the, the application package and were part of the agenda package. Those include uh, drawings, site drawings, uh, some elevation drawings of the building, uh, a, a full planning justification, which I think is going to be the bulk of the, the, the uh, presentation from the consultant this evening, uh, a functional servicing uh, report, which talks about the, uh, the servicing uh, nature of the, of the development or the servicing needs and uh, relates that back to the, the city's services and the ability to provide that servicing, and a traffic uh, brief and a traffic impact letter uh, with a, a, a terms of reference for the full traffic study, which is currently underway. Uh, the property itself is uh, uh, just over one hectare in size. It's uh, 2.6 acres um, with just under 90 metres of frontage onto Stella Crescent. It's bounded with uh, the St Mary's Catholic School on the south side, CFB Trenton uh, lands directly to the east, and then other residential lands in the form of low-rise apartments and single-family dwellings um, to the north uh, and immediately adjacent to the site. Currently, from a, from a planning perspective, the, in the, the real rationale of the need for the official plan amendment, uh, this uh, property in this area sits within District 9C of the city's official plan, which from a residential perspective permits low and medium density residential, and that includes single family homes, townhouses, semi-detached duplex, that type of thing. Also, low rise apartments up to uh, uh, a maximum height of four storeys. Uh, with an overall density limit of 25 units per acre. Uh, obviously, as, 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 as you'll already tell from the information provided, the proposal exceeds those density uh, limits and the height limits, hence the need for the official plan amendment. So effectively, what the, the application is looking to do is to take this site uh, individually um, and place it in a special policy area that will allow for high density development. Um, and there'll be rationale provided in the justification report and the presentation as to how that how that fits and that meets those standards. Uh, but that's the so 25 units per per acre under the current uh, standard. The proposal would take that up to just over 53 units per acre. So it's a significant change to the to the overall density. Within the official plan, while this is in a low density, low to medium density area, the official plan does have policies that relate to. Uh, the criteria by which high density development can happen. Um, those are uh, confirmation of servicing, uh, the compatibility with the neighbourhood, which is one of the, the primary topics for uh, this presentation and for the, the, the application, uh, proximity to services that people use on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that's uh, commercial facilities, schools, uh, hospitals, all that type of thing, um, access to arterial or collector roads uh, for, for traffic needs, and the ability to provide on-site parking so that there's not an impact on neighbouring streets from a uh, parking perspective. So really the, the goal of this application and the, the, uh, the gist of the uh, information provided by the proponent is to make the case that uh, this site can meet those criteria in order for it to, to be able to uh, accommodate high density development. Um, further to this, so this application is just for the official plan level. Um, 
the uh, if moving forward the the, the proposal uh, carries forward um, a zoning bylaw amendment would be required the obviously with the banqueting hall on the predominant piece of land that's in a community facility zone right now doesn't doesn't allow for residential currently under the zoning um, the so zoning bylaw would be required an amendment would be required and a site plan control application which deals obviously with all the site and engineering details lot grading drainage that type of thing with respect to so we've done already done the first part of the agency circulation for this application uh, fire services um, have commented that uh, on the need for fire flow calculations they would come at a later stage in the process but they've they've also commented on some of the details that would come through site plan fire routes uh, uh, confirmation of fire flows uh, Public Works uh, Department have confirmed that, that there is servicing capacity to accommodate the development both with respect to wastewater and water supply and the consultant's uh, functional servicing study also uh, makes comment on the ability to service the proposed development um, and the uh, Public Works comments also confirm the contents requirements of the traffic study to support this uh, application. Uh, to date, through our consultation, through our, our public consultation, we have received no uh, public comments uh, uh, delivered to the department as a result of the circulation. Agency comments, uh, Lower Trent Conservation, uh, Hydro One, and the school board have all commented no objections or concerns. Uh, so with that, that's the, that's the premise of the application, that's the, the, the proposal in front of us. With that, um, back through the chair, um, this may be the opportunity to get the consultant to speak to the, the detail of the application. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Brian. I will now ask the consultant to come forward and, and do your presentation, and then we'll get into some public uh, comments after that. If Thanks, Brian, for your uh, presentation, and uh, good evening, chair and members of the committee, members of the public in attendance as well. My name is Mike Bennett. I'm a senior planner at WMD Associates, and we're the planning agent uh, for the proponent um, who is proposing uh, this official plan amendment application uh, for 41 to 57 Stella Crescent. Uh, just looking uh, at the site. Is this a little bit better? Yeah, much better. I can hear myself a little bit better, too. Um, I, I, you know, uh, Brian's already gone over the, the site context somewhat. Uh, the site's located on the south side of Stella Crescent, immediately adjacent to CFB Trenton. Uh, the area, area is characterized by a mix of predominantly residential uses, walk-up apartments, uh, low-rise residential uses as well, and the adjacent uh, St. Mary Catholic School. And then the broader context uh, in Trenton, uh, we are located on the east side of town, close to the base again, uh, closely accessible to Dixon Drive, which does provide direct access to the base, as well as uh, to, the, to the west side of town, uh, including the downtown across the river. Uh, Dundas Street is uh, located to the south, so we've got a wide variety of commercial uh, services and amenities within walking or biking distance or a very short drive as well. And then looking at the actual site itself, we've got the existing banquet hall on site. Um, the proposed development would essentially um, almost maintain the footprint of the existing banquet hall, which would be demolished to make way for the development. We do have a, a large segment of the site at the northwest corner, um, uh, where formerly there were two detached dwellings, which, as mentioned, were uh, previously demolished. We do have a sizable surface parking area within the south end of the site as well. And in the immediate surroundings, we do have walk-up apartment buildings to the east and the west. To the south, we have St. Mary Catholic School. Uh, the school building itself is located to the southwest of our site, and the schoolyard um, backs onto the rear uh, of our property as well. Uh, in the area, we do also have Stella Park immediately north of us, opposite Stella Crescent. Further north is Dixon Drive, an arterial road, and uh, to its north are additional residential uses. Uh, looking at the official plan situation, we do have a newly adopted OP, as we know. Um, not yet in force, however, we have you know made reference to the, the planning policies in the new official plan and our planning rationale. Uh, both the in-force and adopted OP 
uh, recognize the site designation as urban planning district. And then more specifically, we're in District 9C, which as Brian mentioned, permits low and medium residential uh, development. And so medium density does allow apartments up to four stories. Uh, we are permitting something uh, slightly taller than that. Um, so the basis of the official plan amendment is to permit high density residential uses, uh, which include apartment buildings greater than four stories with a net density above 50 units uh, per um, 0.4 hectares. Schedule D of the official plan uh, indicates that we have kind of a natural hazard area to the east associated with a creek that flows south into the Bay of Quinty. And we're located outside of the noise exposure area associated with the Air Force Base. And this is also critical to our application schedule F for transportation. Uh, Dixon Drive is recognized as a major collector road and uh, that's critical for um, providing a basis for the high density use uh, which is typically directed towards uh, collector roads or in very close uh, proximity to collector roads uh, being Dixon Drive in this case. And of course a, a future application for zoning bylaw amendment will be required uh, to support the proposal. Uh, we do have a split zoning for the site residential type four and community facility zone, which is associated with the banquet hall use. Looking at the site itself, um, you can see that the uh, proposed building um, essentially mirrors the existing footprint of the banquet hall. We do maintain the curb, access, uh, curb cuts um, with the main access point located to the northwest of the building and uh, a secondary uh, point of exit uh, along the east side of the proposed building. Uh, the, much of the remainder of the uh, site is dedicated to surface parking with some uh, boundary um, landscaping along the edges of the site. And uh, just in general, uh, the density is 0 0.92 uh, times the lot area and uh, we're proposing a height of eight stories currently proposing 140 dwelling units. We are contemplating going up to an additional, uh, an additional eight units to 148. And it's our intent to meet the zoning bylaw regulation requirement for car parking, which is 1.5 spaces per unit. And that's regardless of whether the unit count does change. Uh, just looking at the basement floor plan, we've got um, storage for building management as well as a sizable uh, place for bike storage and uh, lockers for residents. And the ground floor plan provides a, a whole host of amenity spaces for future residents. We've got a amenity room which can be programmed to meet the needs of, of residents. We have a gym, uh, a boardroom for um, working from home, um, a commercial kitchen as well. And, um, and kind of the back of house operations as well. The lobby is located at the north end of the building oriented along uh, Stella Crescent. We provided a floor plan which is uh, quite consistent, in fact consistent through levels uh, two through eight. I've just color coded the unit typology here. Um, we've had consultation with um, uh, members from the uh, Canadian Forces base to determine generally what type of units are, are desirable for um, uh, for folks in the area. And uh, two bedrooms are, are, from what we understand, in quite high demand. Uh, they're indicated in red. Uh, we have one bedroom units indicated in orange and um, currently one studio unit per floor uh, just indicated in white. Um, the additional units, from what I understand, are, are likely to uh, be comprised largely of studio. So we'll be approximately adding one studio unit per floor. And we'll provide updated plans to staff um, when those plans have been finalized. Just for reference, I'll provide a mechanical penthouse plan, um, basically recessed from the roof line, uh, just to kind of limit uh, kind of the visibility and exposure from the surrounding areas. And we've provided uh, some uh, elevation drawings along the southwest 
north and east sides as well, just to show the general form of the building uh, entrances as well. Uh, so again, we have an eight-story building. You can see the mechanical penthouse is recessed from the edges of the roof line just to minimize its visual impact and mitigate any issues related to noise and things of that nature. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, I'm happy to provide any additional comments. Um, we do have our architect Ali in, in attendance. Uh, Mark is here to speak to um, you know, the housing demands in the area if you have any specific questions related to that. And we also have uh, our consultants from WSP representing uh, transportation and Crozier uh, representing civil engineering. Uh, I understand they may have challenges uh, connecting and being able to provide comments, but at bare minimum, they're they're here to observe and um, take down uh, notes that we can respond at a later date as needed. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much for the presentation, Mark. Do you want to say a few words in, please, before I open it up? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to really speak to. I'm Mark Bateman. Uh, I'm on with the development team. I live in the municipality of Brighton, and as Mr. Elliot knows, Mr. Hare, I'm former councillor in the municipality of Brighton as well. And the reason I got involved with this project, as I've known uh, the developer Rye for a couple of years now, and I think extremely highly of what he does and what he's trying to accomplish, because that was my goal when I was on council, because we all know, and everybody in the crowd would know, the need for not just housing. We hear from the province, we need houses, 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 but we need affordable houses and affordable rentals, and that's why I'm passionate about this project. I just wanted to touch on, uh, Mike touched on the composition of the units, and that came based on what we heard was the need. Prior to our first meeting with uh, Quinty West, Mayor Harrison, and uh, Brian, the Director of Planning, we met with the Deputy Wing Commander and the Wing Commander. Uh, we have met virtually or in person with uh, MFRC and also the Canadian Armed Forces Housing Authority, and the over overwhelming need that we have heard is the bachelors and the two-bedroom. Currently at the base, the PMQs, we, they've got the hotels and the, they call them the shacks. There's a 200 person waiting list or plus for priority one postings. And then there's the priority two postings. And I'm not sure what the numbers are on that, but I'm assuming they would be just as high. And the priority twos are those that used to live on the base that are trying to get back on and there's a wait list. And we've all heard that they want to expand the base. And there's already the need for the housing here. So this is just making it more prominent and these are going to be affordable rentals it's in a perfect location and uh, if there's any any questions that i can uh, help with the only other thing i'll touch on with the base when we met with the wing commander wing commander and the deputy wing commander the first thing i wanted to ask them because i know knew that either your committee or brian would ask is sight lines when you have a tower there because it is the proximity to the base and that was the first thing they said it has zero impact on flights, sight lines, or anything. They are very excited. They had no issues with the location of this building. It will impact them zero in terms of their operation status. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that part from the base. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. I'm thank you. sure uh, after we open it up to the public, there may be some questions or things, details you may want to answer, and then we'll open it up to the committee. Mayor Harrison, did you want to say a few words before we get going here? Yeah, just, uh, just to make a couple of I guess I hope for clear clarity statements. Uh, number one, this hall was uh, Knights of Columbus Hall, and for a good many years they operated it and uh, did it to the best of their ability. And uh, found as time went on that they couldn't continue to operate and still maintain expenses. And so uh, present owner bought the building, and he certainly has worked hard to try to make it uh, function as well. And it's been. Uh, very uh, difficult uh, for him as, you know, COVID hasn't helped us at all. So, you know, this development, uh, and of course the, the, the council of the city of Quinney West is not any different than any other council. We're under a lot of pressure from the province and the province is telling us to build and build and build. Yes, that's the pressure we're under. And, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we have to come up with a plan and, uh, Brian Jardine is working on a plan that will will be presented to both the provincial and federal governments in hopes that they accept what we're trying to do is is what we're doing is is to the best of our ability, and hopefully there will be some possibly some grant money come towards us that uh, we can hopefully use in the 
in the best way possible to help with development. So, you know, that, that's where we're at. We're, uh, uh, and, the, and the other part that uh, really is, uh, is, is uh, going to be the, an issue tonight is density. Density. And I'll give you an example. We, uh, back in 2003, put water and wastewater lines out Telephone Road all the way to produce processors. And those lines were built, built what we thought were, were large enough to handle any development in that area. But since the province has come back and increased the density, and I'll ask Brian to tell us exactly what the increased density is in terms of figures, and, and I'll say a few more words. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the, so the area that the, the Mayor's referring to is uh, a traditional low-density uh, area um, uh, on the, the western boundary of the municipality. Like up until recently, the, our densities were around 10 units per, per acre. Um, through recent changes, uh, we're now looking at 25 units per acre. So that's the kind of the changes we're seeing at the low, the low density end of the scale. So, yeah. And, and that's what we're faced with. So take, let's go back to Telephone Road. And as I said, we put water and wastewater out there with, uh, we thought, capacity to handle any development. But just because uh, the density has increased, now we're forced to increase the size of the lines. Uh, i give you an example. We have to, uh, in order to develop on Hellier Road, which is right next to Produce Processors on the north side of Telephone, we're taking, I think it's an 18-inch water line from Highway 2 all the way up Fuller Road under the rail through Mr. Voskamp's property and through uh, Premier Lake over to Hellier Road. That's, that's the project that's got to be done in order to be able to develop any kind of residential development on Hellier Road. So that, that's, that's what we're all up against. Uh, yes, you know, changes in terms of our city, our municipality, yes, they will be, and it, it uh, is based on the need and what's uh, indicated here today. We need homes, apartments, and so on for military members who are transferred into Eight Wing or want to come here to work. Right now, it's, it's almost impossible to find anything that's available that you can rent. So that's, that's what we're all up against, and we're, we are, you know, charged with the responsibility to try to make things work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You, have a, you all finish, or you want to say a couple more words? Nope. Absolutely. I appreciate oh, okay. the opportunity, and uh, yeah, if there's questions later in the process, okay. I'm, happy I'm sure to there answer. might be. So wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. At this time, uh, I would ask uh, if there's any members of the public. Uh, first, I'll start. Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this? Uh, uh, Presentation and, and as uh, Brian has said, we're 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 not voting uh, to approve anything tonight. This is an open public meeting, and it will come in the next stage. So this is an information meeting. So if you want to come forward and and uh, speak, and then also I'll be asking if anybody is in opposition or has questions. So please Good state your name for the record, please. Good evening. I'm Heather Voskamp, and I live in Trenton. Um, and I'm just here to lend my support uh, to what I see as a good first step in improving the housing opportunities in Quinney West. Um, affordable and inclusive sustainable supporting housing has been one of my goals for years. I have uh, been worked, worked with Mark in Brighton uh, for that reason. Um, this area has seen housing prices skyrock and the housing stock has been removed um, in order to uh, get used for short-term rentals, Airbnbs. Um, the recent influx of Ukrainians uh, displaced by the war that have made Quinney West uh, region their home, they were able to find employers really easily, uh, but they struggled to find accommodations that they could afford um, so they could rebuild their lives. Um, as Mark has already talked about, military um, Personnel are shocked by the lack of housing options in the area and the uh, long list for the PMQs. Um, chronic underfunding of the ODSP effectively treats people who have a serious chronic uh, diagnosed disability of unworthy of living with dignity and respect. Um, and they are unable to find housing without support of housing affordable housing, many of them find themselves on the street, which then just spirals into a variety of other negative outcomes. Uh, the lack of affordable housing and the general supply shortage 
is uh, not a one-size-fits-all solution. But I believe amending the official plan to allow for a high-density residential development in this location makes sense and is a step in the right direction in improving housing for Queenie West. Okay, thank you. We appreciate your presentation. Anyone else who would uh, like to address um, this proposal? Uh, please come forward, please. State your name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Tom Painter. I live at 35 Fairview Crescent and I own a property on Dixon Drive occupied by my daughter. Um, my concern is naturally the height of the building is one thing, but the density and the traffic flow in the area. Mayor Jim knows me very well. I was a member of the Knights of Columbus and still am, so I have good knowledge of this hall. I know the traffic coming across Stella Crescent to turn on Dixon Drive has always been somewhat of a concern. It's a da dangerous type of intersection at that point just past the hall. Also, the traffic on Dixon coming from the base, both in the morning and the evening, is quite heavy. To add increased density will cause, I think, a problem to the homes living off Dixon Drive to get in and out of their driveways. Also, I think that a high impact density may cause the value of the homes facing out the hall to lose some of their value because there's no control of who will be occupying the, the, that apartment. I know it's probably geared to military, and I know very well what's happening on the base, but I'm somewhat concerned about the type of personnel that will be occupying that building. So I thank you very much for hearing me. Okay, thank you. Your concerns will be recorded, that's for sure. So, J.D. Um, Sorry, sir, can I, can I ask a follow-up? Can I ask a follow-up question, please? Certainly. Uh, what are your concerns? You mentioned uh, the, the type of people who would live there. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I, there are sections in town here that have apartment buildings. Yeah. And after a while, the type of people renting the apartment changes. I know that they're, they've, they're talking about military, but I don't believe it'll be only military renting the apartment. And if the cost is low enough and reasonable enough, you'll have other people in town that will rent the apartment. And that may change the type of people. Uh, so I, I, I'm not reading you. What, what type of people are you referring to? No, no I'm, just, I'm just concerned that uh, there may be, you know, a low, lower income people that may be able to get in there with help. Is, is that a bad thing, though? Beg your pardon? Is it a bad thing? No, it's not. I'm, I'm just saying okay. that, you know, you've got a he heavy density. Yeah. You know, uh, I hope there'll be controls about, you know, the noise factor and, yeah. and so forth. That's basically my concern. Well, I, I agree with that concern. I'm just a, a little, uh, I was just uh, confused by your uh, comment about the people living there. Have you gone to Tim Hortons this week at all? Beg your pardon? Have you been to Tim Hortons this week? No, I have not. Have, have you been anywhere? Stores, restaurants? No. No, Not in the last month. Yes, I have. Someone served you a coffee? Yes. Okay. Do you think they're high income? No, I'm not I'm not challenging that. that well, I just that but, but I I'm I'm just concerned with your your concern over the type of people who will live there. I'm just concerned that there may be some people in our community, all right, that occupy other buildings that are a problem that may end up in that area. I'm not saying it will, it may not at all. What, what problem do these people pose? Well, the drug problem, for instance. Okay, mental That's, health issue, it's addiction is very, very it's tough issue. It's prevalent in our yeah. area. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm just concerned that hopefully there will okay. be things in place, right, to help these people and that they can better themselves in this area. I'm not saying that they should be excluded. I'm just saying 
hopefully there will be some controls in place that will not impact the value of the homes in the area. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Okay, thank you. And certainly we can't discriminate against people too if they qualify, uh, they certainly have every right to occupy or rent or even buy where they do, but we, we know that sometimes there is an element that's out there, that's for sure, but uh, that's, we can't predetermine everything. If we had a crystal ball, we'd have it all made, I guess, for our futures and whatever. But anyway, anyone else would like to address uh, this presentation uh, as far as any concerns, opposition, or uh, otherwise? Would the uh, president like to ad address, maybe I know we haven't had a lot of uh, uh, Questions for you, but would you uh, like to address it? Maybe any accommodation uh, issues and, and management style? I'll put it that way. So oh, certainly, yeah, um, yeah. One of, one of the the main focuses of this application is to introduce purpose built rental, which, uh, as we know, is um, you know we have a very low vacancy rate in this area. Um, in doing our background research, we learned from October 2019, uh, the vacancy rate for uh, purpose built rental apartments was approximately. Uh, four percent or slightly above which is you know a fairly health healthy level uh, but it's gone down to uh, just um, just over two percent uh, to October 2022 so basically cut in half in a, in a matter of three years we can only uh, you know assume that um, a similar kind of trajectory could feasibly continue so so we are introducing purpose-built rental in fact um, relative to the amount of, of re rental units that currently exist in Quinty West as a whole, we'd actually be increasing that stock by 8.5%. So, you know, it's a it's a impactful project in that regard. And uh, additionally, 20% would be affordable units uh, as currently composed. Thank you, we appreciate that. And as you know, we're going through a little bit of an issue on uh, Sydney Street. There were some rental evictions and whatever, and uh, there might be people there looking for a, another accommodation, just the way the issue is, is going along. But. Uh, Tessa, I have three, I think, three ladies here listed on as participant panelists. Do you know if they want to speak? Uh, are they, do you have them hooked up at all? Or? Okay. Okay. But if they so wish, why, just let me know. I didn't see any hands uh, up. Usually they put a hand or a colored hand that I can uh, acknowledge them, but I don't want them to think I w that the uh, committee here was... Uh, uh, you know, sidestepping them uh, in their opportunity to speak. So, Brian, would you like to maybe uh, uh, speak to the traffic situation and traffic studies? And I know that's something that'll be coming, but uh, I know that was brought up. Uh, maybe you would like to address that as far as the city end of it. Yeah, thank th you, Mr. Chair. The um, uh, so what's been su supplied so far. So th this is a kind of a middle step in the process. Obviously, we're still to come back with a full recommendation. So I don't know if there's any additional traffic information. We did receive a, a traffic impact uh, letter with a terms of reference for the study that's being done. Um, so that work is underway. The consultants may have additional comments for this evening on that. If not, that information will be brought back to the committee when the recommendations there. The, the one thing I would say, and the committee have heard me say this before, on on other properties as well is that there is a um, particularly for for residents that live in an area when you see uh, density increases what traffic is is uh, undoubtedly one of the immediate one of the 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 uh, front and center issues that's talked about um, the reality of the situation is that for most if not all of uh, the road systems within our urban areas and even even outside of the urban areas um, while they get uh, busier when there's more traffic and then when there's more population th that leads to more traffic um, most of our, our roads operate well below their design standards uh, both in terms of the amount of traffic on the roads and the intersections uh, when it comes to intersections both in terms of safety and traffic movements part of the analysis that's done for a development like this is to assess the, the way that the intersection performs the impact of the development and whether that leads to a requirement for signalization stop signs, whatever form of traffic management system, or nothing. Um, but the one comment I always make is that, that very often for residents, and we, we, we've all seen this, I know I've seen this in, 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 in the area in which I live, in which new development creates more traffic. And yes, it may take you longer to pull out of your driveway, there may be tr more traffic on the road, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's too much traffic, because the roads can accommodate a lot more traffic than exists today, as a general standard. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. So. 
I would say stay tuned to further information and uh, fine tuning of what uh, will take place in the future. Chair, if I could add a, a few other just general points. Sure, um, go I'm, ahead. You know, I'm not a traffic engineer, um, although of course um, you know our, our folks from WSP are listening. Just at a high level, I mean, this site is situated uh, on the east end of town. So if we're talking about uh, the, the base being kind of the prime destination for potential residents, um, they would pull out to the right onto Dixon Drive, bypassing all residential neighborhoods to the right. So, um, you know, uh, to Brian's point, you know, if there was ever, a, you know, a intersection redesign or signalization necessary, of course, we work with the um, city to, um, to do our part to accommodate that. Um, but but we think this site is actually very well situated to avoid traffic infiltration within other areas of the city as well. So um, um, I'll just close my remarks at this point. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else wishes to come forward and address it? If not, I'm going to ask the committee if they have any questions before we move on. Uh, feel, feel free to come forward and uh, entertain any questions or concerns you might have. Okay, seeing none, uh, committee, other, I know JD has had uh, some fine points there. Anybody else have any questions for the consultant or the, about the proposal? Uh, feel free to uh, speak right now and we'll uh, move on. Just uh, just reference to, uh, sorry, Pierre. no, I'm, I'm not gonna ask you a question, but uh, reference to uh, buildings and apartments and tenants and so on. Uh, we do have uh, the apartments on Sydney Street and Bay Street, et cetera, that were owned by Mr. Klemensik and they've been sold and a company from Toronto purchased the buildings so with the, Mr. Klemensik uh, was a Knights of Columbus member but he was also a very, uh, what you'd say, humanistic individual who, uh, uh, you know, tried to work with his tenants to make sure that people had a good place to live. You look after what I have, pay your rent and we'll get along just fine. And the rents in those buildings are in the neighborhood of a thousand dollars, maybe a little higher now, but not not a lot. And that was the kind of uh, facility. And and uh, yeah, and and I I can't tell you how many he owned. It doesn't matter. But the point I want to make is that he had great tenants, and they lived there. Some of them have been there 20 years, and they call it's their home. It, that's exactly what it is. Their home, and they look after it, respect it, and uh, and you can see when you look at the buildings that they're well maintained and, and well taken care of. So I, I see this as what we're trying to do here, similar, and uh, provide a place for people to live. And, and Nate Wing, uh, yes, I've met with uh, uh, Colonel Dahl, uh, base commander, and yes, it certainly is uh, a difficult uh, issue to find places for the military people to live. And you remember a few years ago, they bought the property north, which is called Frank Myers property, and. Uh, they were coming from Ottawa. Well, there were some. There's been some hiccups, and that hasn't happened. They're going to build some ammunition storage facility in that area. That's what's going to happen. So, yes, uh, there are a lot of changes taking place. Uh, you know, and, and and I I'm very proud of the military. Proud of uh, every day. I'm a I'm a mayor that can boast an air show every day. Not many can, but I know that the people in that aircraft are going someplace to make life better for other people, and you know it too. So, yeah, we've got a lot of good things here, and uh, I know that people have to be and will be treated with respect, and that's what we expect. Thank you. Councilor Kutzing, you have a question? Uh, thanks very much, yeah. Uh, this is the type of development uh, our city needs, uh, apartment buildings, and I know in many of the newer subdivisions, there are some uh, apartment buildings that are getting included uh, with the development. And we do have a lot of subdivisions that are uh, in the planning uh, planning works or in the planning process. And uh, one day in five or seven years, there's gonna be a lot more properties around. But, but uh, this is the type of development that I'm excited to see. So uh, I'll be following this with uh, great interest. And I did have a, a Quick question for um, Director of Planning, Mr. Jardine, in regards to our current um, official plan and hopefully sometime in the coming months, our new official plan. Uh, does, this, uh, does this development um, have any effect from the current official plan to the 
the uh, proposed official plan, is there any uh, change uh, or any benefit if it was, uh, say, this application came to us like next year instead of today? That's all. Just curious. Yeah, th thank you too, Mr. Chair. That's, that's a good point. The, while the official plan is, is going through an update and there are some changes to the densities, this application would still require an official plan amendment specific to the site, irrespective of whether it's the current plan or if the new plan was in place. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Anyone else uh, down the line here have any questions at this time? Uh, Councilor McHugh? No, I have no question. I think it's, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this. I'd like to see, see it follow through. Uh, as uh, Councilor Kunzi uh, said, we, we need this type of building. We need apartment buildings. I, I go into Belleville quite often. <laughs> They're popping up all over the place. People need a place to live, and I think it's great. And I'm sure uh, dealing with the type of tenant, I'm sure they're going to have a good management team in place. They're just not going to open the doors and just let anybody in. I'm sure there's going to be rules and regulations to be followed. I'm sure they want to be as much a success as the city of Queen of West does. So I look forward to seeing this as it, as it moves through the channels. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll, we'll move on, and we appreciate your uh, comments and concerns, and uh, like we say, uh, it's just in, in the early stages, and uh, I don't know, Brian, when do you have any timeline where you might think this would be brought back uh, just to keep people informed? Uh, and I know they can sign your name, and, and you can keep them uh, informed uh, as far as uh, progress goes and carries on. But Yeah, th yeah through you, Mr. Chair, thanks for asking that. I think uh, of Prior to the, this evening's meeting, it's always hard to say that because you never know how what kind of level of comment and, and, and further work is required. But based on this evening's meeting, I don't see any reason that we couldn't have this back on the agenda for, for next committee. Thanks, Ron. Okay, thank you very much. That uh, gives us some time frame and, and keeps things moving along, that's for sure. Okay, your comments regarding the application and staff report have been recorded and will be forwarded to the members of council to Glenn, together with the minutes of this meeting. Council will make a decision to approve or refuse the stated application, which we're not voting on tonight. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, these minutes will be going to before the council Wednesday, July the 12th, 2023. We now move to item eight, which is public input. You're certainly welcome to come forward and ask a question about anything or uh, that's on the agenda or, or not. Uh, uh, we do have... Uh, two um, decision items down below, and normally we, we deal with questions regarding it at this time, although I, sometimes we have uh, relaxed the rules and asked questions uh, uh, after each uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, if you wish to come forward, uh, that's I'll leave it up to your recognizance whether you want to do that at this time or you want to wait till the presentation is done of each uh, decision item. Okay? You want to wait? Okay. All right, then. That's no, no problem. I just want to make you aware that you have a, an opportunity. Okay, we, we go to item nine, presentations. We have none, delegations, none, and decision items. And item 11 and 11.1. And the first one is staff report 23-64 PD, a red line amendment and a draft plan of condominium and the owners 2632863 Ontario, Inc. Ken Nicholson is the representative and the agent is Van Meer Limited. Arnold Van Meer is the... Um, also, the agent to uh, in, in this regard, uh, the location is 260 North Trent Street, and the file number is D09-F11-05. Dale, would you like to address this application, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through the chair, the application that is before the committee this evening is for major red line amendments to a previously approved draft plan of condominium. This previously approved draft plan of condominium was approved by a former City of Quinney West Council in 2006. Schedule A attached to this evening's agenda illustrates the previous draft approved plan overlaid with the proposed red line amendments in red. Schedule B illustrates the proposed draft plan of vacant land condominium. The proposed major red line amendments are for clarification that the condominium structure is to be a vacant land condominium, reconfiguration of the condominium units and the internal condominium road, inclusion of a turnaround within the internal condominium road, reduction of the total number of units from 46 to 43. In support of this application, the proponent has completed an environmental impact study, a fisheries impact study, a stage one and two archeological assessment, and a phase one and two environmental assessment. The proposed vacant land condominium will be serviced by municipal water and wastewater services. The internal road will be a condominium road, which is fully owned and maintained by the future condominium corporation. The water and wastewater services contained on the property will also be owned by the future condominium corporation. 
The original draft plan approval required that the proponent provide an easement to the city for access to Bata Island. That easement was previously deeded to the city and is currently enjoyed by the City of Quinney West residents for access to the island. The application was heard at the May 18th, 2023 Planning Advisory Committee meeting for public input. A number of residences, residents attended the meeting with questions surrounding the proposed development. A resident had inquired how the proposed development would, would impact the water and wastewater servicing capacity for Frankfurt. It was noted that as the subject property had previously received draft plan approval, the capacity has been allocated to the site. Another resident had inquired about how the increased density would impact the community of Frankfurt. The proposed development is within the density permitted by the city's official plan and additional density is a natural occurrence of development. Residents had also, also had questions regarding the type of built form that would occur as a result of the proposed development. The R2-1 zone will permit single detached dwellings and the height, layout and size will be determined by the developer and or future buyers all of which will need to comply with the city's zoning bylaw. Another resident had brought forward concerns about contamination and if an environmental assessment had been completed on the subject property. A phase one and two environmental assessment was completed on the property and a record of site condition has been obtained from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. An environmental impact study and fisheries impact study have also been completed by the proponent in support of the application. Lower Trent Conservation and Parks Canada have also provided formal comments on the application. Lower Trent has indicated that they have no objection to the approval of the application, provided that the entirety of the floodway associated with the Trent River in this location is placed in the Environmental Protection Zone. Lower Trent Conservation has also recommended that the 18 meter shoreline buffer be demarcated with armor stone or similar landscaping material in the rear yards where the shoreline buffer is to be present. Parks Canada has also commented that they have no objection to the application. The subject property is located within Planning District 3 of the Frankfurt Urban Service Area. The policies of this district permits low and medium density residential land uses, including single detached dwellings in accordance with low density residential policies. The proposed red line amendment conforms to the provincial policy statement and the city's official plan. The application is therefore recommended for approval. Thank you very much, Neil. Is there anyone in attendance who wishes to uh, um, speak in favor of this other than the applicant or opposition or concerns or general questions yes sir come forward state your name and address please a few questions patrick curtain 240 north trent street uh let's go back to your in the minutes of the meeting which by the way are really very complete, actually more complete than what we heard at the previous meeting. Uh, you indicate that there's an 18 meter naturalization, naturalized setback and a 12 meter set, an additional 12 meter setback. Who will be responsible for the upkeep maintenance of this 30 meter setback? Uh, through the chair, as part of the environmental impact study, uh, it suggests that the 18 meter buffer should be uh, basically maintained by the condo corporation and then the 12 meter setback will be maintained by the uh, individual unit owner. So what you're saying then is that uh, there's a 12 meter setback behind the houses which are the quote unquote waterfront and they get to maintain that additional 12 meters or does the condo, the condominium board maintain it on behalf of the residents. Uh, so through the chair, uh, technically it's a 30 meter setback, uh, 12 meters from the back of the property, 12 meters in, would be maintained by the property owner or the condo unit owner. Then the next 18 meters to the waterfront would be owned by the, or maintained by the condominium corporation. Okay. Uh, be because this is a, a vacant land, condominium the municipality has the right and or the responsibility I suppose to set out restrictions or uh, parameters for the development for, for the uh, appearance of these buildings has Quinney West set out any restrictions with respect to the buildings and or structures that are going to be part of this condo complex Brian 
Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, other than the uh, other than anything that's mandated by the zoning in terms of the the, the building scale and setbacks, uh, in terms of design quality or anything like that, no, that's not something that we would impose generally on uh, any development. Um, and we certainly there's no proposal at this point in time to to provide that kind of design control or maintenance control. That would be controlled by the condominium corporation. And uh, can you? Tell me what the common elements of the condominium are. Uh, through the chair, uh, so it's not a common elements condominium. Uh, it's a vacant land condo. I understand um, that, but, but so there, are, there are parts of that condominium which the residents must contribute a fund to, to maintain or pay into. But that would be the road. Water, sewer, road maintenance, yeah. et cetera. Ro the utilities uh, from the property line all the way to the units would be privately owned by the condominium corporation. Um, the roadway would be owned by the condominium corporation and the unit owners would be responsible for paying for the maintenance of those items. And water and sewer is paid to? Uh, that would be included in the utilities and that would, uh, depending on how the condominium corporation structures it, uh, they would have to sort that out. And f finally, uh, I have one more question that has to do with the notion of uh, Freehold, no, the, some of the, con the, the, uh, the developer has the authority, has the right to maintain some of these units as for lease, call them leasehold condos as opposed to freehold. Will there be leasehold condos or houses in this complex? Uh, through the chair, the, my understanding of the concept is that the condom uni condominium units are vacant land and those will be essentially owned by each condominium unit owner. Uh, they won't, I don't believe that they'll be leasing the land per se, um, as it'll be more of a condominium structure than a leasehold development. Um, but I would leave that up to the, uh, the applicant's agent to answer any more questions on the legality of the structure. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else wishes to address any questions or concerns? Arnold, uh, would you like to address any, uh, maybe the question, few questions we've had here? Uh, and I know our Dale's tried to answer them the best of your ability, but I guess you're involved in the, uh, I guess, management, I'll put it that way, of the future build. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I think what Dale answered pretty well. All the questions over there, I think the most last one was maybe a little unclear, but uh, it is a vacant land condominium unit. Anything that's on the property, it will be owned and operated and maintained by the condominium corporation. And that's where the basic common element cost fees are coming towards. So snow plowing, maintaining the roads, upkeep, uh, the sewer connections, et cetera, are all the responsibility being addressed through the condominium corporation. Um, Setbacks are being delineated as well to, to try to uh, ensure that the buffer is maintained, uh, naturalized uh, along the Trent River. Uh, and then there's a sort of the setback. The, the, the lots are extra deep as you can compare if you were driving down that proposed roadway uh, on the right-hand side of the riverside, those lots are very deep. Uh, on the left-hand side, they're more shallow. They're sort of, the lots are basically standard-sized lots within a plan of subdivision. They're 50 foot by 100 feet deep, if not more. So they're equivalent to, a sub. if you're doing a draft plan of subdivision, these lots would be comparable to that. Uh, the advantage is that uh, the lots are deeper on the riverside, more to address the buffering that's required. And the whole red line revision was about to try to address the old concept that did encroachments towards the river. Um, we had to deal with the flood line mapping that was done along the river. So that's what really brought up the red line revision. The whole process technically isn't even for a public issue. It's a formality we're going through. It should be approved. We're trying to just receive public, additional public input and try to resolve them. Uh, the actual units, they're a house. Um, if it had been a, a standard condominium, the corporation would have been maintaining the yards around them. They would have been maintaining the structure. Um, this basically is an effect almost driving into a subdivision. The people are responsible for their own houses. They're responsible for their own uh, yards. Uh, they're not getting city snow plowing. They're not getting city garbage removal. They're taking care of that through the corporation. Um, I can guarantee that somebody would buy a house, a unit in there, and rent it to somebody. 
that's allowed anywhere in the city. Um, it's an investment opportunity possibly, but I see the this location of this property, it's gonna be ownership. Uh, the people, that location is gonna draw people there to own it and wanna live there. So I see a very slim chance of the type of house that's being proposed for there on those type of lots that they would be a rental unit, but I can't guarantee that. That's as happens anywhere, right? You can see that in any subdivision and there would be some immersion of maybe one or two units like that happening. But again, everything would be controlled again by the condominium corporation uh, to try to keep the standards up. If the unit owners are not maintaining the property, the corporation goes back in and will maintain it and they'll also then be charging it back to their unit owners. So it's gonna maintain a uh, high class development for this area. Thank you very much, we appreciate that. Anyone else before I uh, ask the committee to uh, uh, consider this? And then uh, we do have an appro approval recommendation here. Uh, so I'll, if there's no one else in the audience who wish to address this, uh, I will now ask the committee, uh, Mr. Forsyth. Yeah. Just have a comment. This is like, this development's a really good use of repurposing land. It was in an old industrial site from what I remember. Um, you guys have, I think, incurred the ins expense of cleaning up. I think Mr. Vandermeer said at the last meeting. And it's just given the, that area in Frankfurt an opportunity to for some regrowth, I guess for lack of better terms. Um, and the land use is just, is just great. You know, We should see more things like this. We're not at, sitting here talking about encroaching on prime agricultural land. We're talking about an old industrial site building houses on it. That's all I wanted to say. Anyone else uh, wish to uh, make comment on this? Sure. Uh, Councilor Kutze. Uh, thanks very much, and I didn't I didn't think of this at the the last time that this came forward, and I am going to support it. Um, I'm just hoping that the uh, the owners of the condominium corporation will follow the advice of the conservation authority with an respect to uh, shoreline management and uh, let Mother Nature assist the shoreline management uh, with the the water um, clarity and cleanliness. Uh, there is. Uh, plant growth that can uh, that can assist everybody. Um, so if the condominium owners will uh, follow the advice of the Conservation Authority with their shoreline, I would be very happy, but I am gonna support the decision item, thanks. Okay, any other questions or comments? If not, I would entertain a motion. To okay, I'll, I'll uh, make a motion that we uh, approve. Uh, and I'd just like to make a comment too. Uh, the, the condominium corporation doesn't have any option. They have to follow the uh, guidelines that are established. There's no choice. And uh, yes, uh, our, 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 the drinking water for Ward 1 comes from the Trent River, you know, and uh, so it's our responsibility as a municipality to make sure that the, anything that goes in the river is uh, acceptable and meets the standards uh, established by the Ministry of the Environment. So the condominium corporation doesn't have, as far as I'm concerned, any leeway in terms of meeting the guidelines and the, the rules that the Conservation Authority puts out there. Yes, uh, this is, uh, is, yeah, it's wise use of the land. It's hard, uh, it's hard to envision what's happening. I, I listen, I, I'm not any different than you are. I have a 10 acre field in front of my house, a 10 acre field. And at one time I thought there might be uh, room for 10 houses. But with the density that they're talking about now, they could put 250 houses. It's, it's scary, you know? Yes, and I keep a herd of cows, and my neighbor milks cows, and we have waste that we have to spread. And if, if you know, if there's, if this is why we have to use uh, the land that, like this wisely. Because you, if, if you start, uh, you know, dropping houses all over the rural areas in, in any municipality, that's going to inhibit or uh, completely eliminate the milking of cows or the raising of beef or the raising of chickens. Uh, Brian could tell you, a few years ago, we tried to look in Quinney West and Hamilton Road to find a spot to build a pig barn. We couldn't find one. It wasn't possible. So that's, this is, yes, I, I, I understand. Yeah, it's, it's a completely different yeah, concept, world, whatever you want to. And I live at the end of the road, and I'm staying there. Thank you. <laughs> at least that's my Okay, it's been moved by uh, Mayor Harrison, second by Councilor McHugh. Any, any further questions or comments from the committee? 
All right, I would ask uh, all in favor of the approval of this recommendation. Carried unanimously, thank you very much. Okay, we now move on to item 11.2, a staff report 23-065 PD, red line amendment, draft plan of subdivision, any owners 1210641, Ontario Limited. Uh, owner operator, Diamond Homes, the agent is Van Meer Limited, Arnold Van Meer is the Vandermeer is the uh, agent uh, uh, representing, and the location is Windover Street. The file number is D12 slash F151 slash 10. Uh, Katie, would you wish to address this uh, application, please? Through you, Mr. Chair, the city received a red line amendment application to increase the number and types of dwellings permitted for a draft plan approved subdivision known as, known as Windover Street in the village of Frankfurt. The draft plan of subdivision was given approval by a previous City of Quinney West Council on June 21st, 2010, and the draft conditions are attached to the staff report that accompanies this application. The proposed red line amendment will revise the draft plan from 11 single detached dwellings to 28 townhouses and one single detached dwelling. The statutory public meeting for this application was held in accordance with the requirements for the Planning Act on Thursday, November the 3rd, 2022. The recommendation put forward by planning staff at that time was to approve the red line amendment application as well as the concurrent zoning bylaw amendment. As both applications complied with the provincial policy statement and the city of city's official plan. The committee's decision was to defer the applications in order to have the applicant provide additional information to address public comments. The staff report being presented to the committee this evening includes a dis discussion of the various comments made by the public at the previous meeting. Public comments in the staff report have been categorized by subject and include the density and form of the development, traffic, emergency access, the existing groundwater conditions, and parks and green space. Members of the public commented on the increased number of units, as well as the change in housing type. Since the public meeting in 2022, the applicant's agent has provided adi additional justification to support the proposed density and the form of development. The proposed development results in a net density of 9.90 units per 0.4 hectares and is within the low density limits as set out by the city's official plan, which allows for a maximum density of 10 units per 0.4 hectares. Individuals in attendance at the meeting noted concerns regarding the existing road network and the potential for increased traffic volumes as a result of the proposed development. A traffic brief prepared by Greer Galloway dated October 21st, 2022 was provided in support of the Red Line application. As a result of the comments received at the public meeting, Greer Galloway prepared an updated traffic brief, which is dated January the 4th, 2023. The traffic brief states that Windover Street would generally be pr the preferred route of travel for the development, as Windover Street is closer to Highway 33 and Frankfurt. Overall, the size of the pro proposed development is relatively small and traffic is likely to use Windover Street. The proposed, tra or the traffic brief states that the existing road network is sufficient to support the proposed development. Members of the public raised concerns pertaining to emergency access to the subject lands during a flood event. Adequate floodplain mapping has now been undertaken for pre and post development conditions on the subject lands. The applicant's engineer has completed a floodplain elevation analysis and has determined that emergency access directly to Windover Street to the proposed development would be available during a flood event. A geotechnical investigation report prepared by Cambium was submitted in January of this year in order to address the concerns regarding the existing subsurface conditions, groundwater conditions, and soil bearing capacity. The geotechnical investigation was conducted on the site by Cambium on December 1st, 2022. The applicant's engineer has confirmed that the foundations for the units are proposed to be above the bedrock and the groundwater table. The the public also commented on the loss of green space and that the proposed development did not include a park. In this regard, planning staff have reviewed the city's official plan along with the city's parks master plan for applicable policies regarding parkland dedication and cash and lieu requirements. The parks master plan determined that this part of Frankfurt is well served for residents in regard to parkland as they're within close proximity to the existing James Street ball field and play area. The Parks Master Plan establishes that residential neighborhoods within 600 meters of existing parkland are considered to be well served. The city's official plan allows for the city to accept cash in lieu payments for parkland dedication. The funds received from this development can be used for the purposes of improving existing parks or purchasing additional parklands and facilities. 
Overall, the provincial policy statement and the city's official plan support a range of housing types within settlement areas such as Frankfurt, as well as efficient uses of lands and services. This proposed infill development in Frankfurt would create servicing efficiencies and reduce pressures to expand urban boundaries. The proposed townhomes are compatible with the existing single detached dwellings, as well as the newly built Brittany Place townhouse development off of Diamond Street. The application is consistent with the provincial policy statement, the city's official plan, and maintains the intent of the zoning bylaw. This application is recommended for approval. Okay, thank you very much, Katie. Is there anyone in attendance who wishes to uh, address or ask any questions in regards to this application and the presentation that has been presented? Please state your name and address for the record, please. Hi, my name is Susan Tanzola and I live at 10 Patrick Drive. Um, although the meeting on November 3rd had more people from the public in attendance, I can assure you that everyone who showed up to the meeting that day and signed the petition we presented to you still feels the same about this red line amendment. Everyone lives busy lives and we only had a few days notice of this meeting, so several people had prior commitments they were unable to change to be here. Essentially, every person in the surrounding properties of this proposed development is opposed to this zoning change. We are not saying that we don't want anything to be built there. This is not a case of not in my backyard. We are asking that the plan be revised with less density to better fit in with the surrounding properties and still allow for green space, nature, and undeveloped land for water to saturate. At the meeting on November 3rd, members of council voted to defer with the requirements for deferral being a review of the density with a recommendation that they decrease the density figure out more logistics regarding the drainage and stormwater, review the conditions of the existing roads that will be used to access this development, such as March Street and Patrick Drive, with the suggestion that they should be brought up to urban standard and that these updates should happen before the development begins, and a comparison for how the water and drainage would be affected between the foundations of 11 single dwelling houses and the foundations of 29 townhouses. From what we can tell, nothing within the plan has changed since the last meeting besides a recommendation to be built in the drier months. None of the requirements for deferral were addressed. At the meeting on November 3rd, most of the responses from the de developer's representative regarding our concerns were in relation to the new builds, how they will be built above the water table, the grades for the new houses will be above the regional water level, they will have newer upgraded infrastructure, there will be sidewalks and curbs on Windover Street for pedestrian safety, etc. He also mentioned that none of the properties would be shaded by these developments. However, those along the east side of Patrick Drive will lose a lot of their morning sun because it will be blocked by these de developments. The lack of responses to our questions specifically regarding our properties created more doubt and made us worry more so that they aren't prioritizing the impact on the, on the existing residences just of the new houses. We understand that if there is damage to our properties, the developer would be liable. While that sounds good in theory, it would not be a simple process. Lawyers and experts would be, need to be involved to prove that the damage and or flooding was in fact caused by the development, which would be costly, stressful and time consuming for the resident. There is also the possibility of the developer being a limited company declaring bankruptcy. Is the municipality willing to sign a liability waiver for damage of, to any of the existing residents' properties to assure us if that happened, they would be liable for all of the costs associated with repairs, legal fees, etc., as they would be the ones approving this project. We have expressed that our primary concerns are the water levels and high potential of flooding and pedestrian safety, especially along March Street. Within the plan, it states that there will be cash in lieu of parks and green space because of the close proximity to the J James Street ball field and play, play area. There is no official plan to bring March Street up to an urban standard to add sidewalks, which poses a pedestrian safety risk as you need to use March Street to access these green space areas. While this plan may look good on paper, the surrounding residents who actually live on the property are the ones who have been battling the water issues there for years. It is barely holding its own with the current wetlands and swamp there acting as a collection sp spot for the water to accumulate, and now the majority of that land will be covered with pavement and houses. Quite often, my sump pump runs several times per minute. Picture turning your bathroom 
bathtub faucet on full. That is the amount of water that often pours into my sump pump in the fall to the spring. Even now, my sump pump is running every two minutes. It is to the point that whenever my sump pump is running, I need to be close and home in case the power goes out so that I can start my generator and prevent my basement from flooding. At an average of 1,440 square feet per unit, approximately 5,760 square foot per four unit block, that equals an approximate total of 41,760 square foot of ground coverage, not including the driveways, road, sidewalk, etc. The original plan for 11 single dwellings estimated at 1,440 square feet each, which is greater than the average square footage of the existing houses, would only cover 15,840 square feet. That is an increase of 163% of land coverage compared to the original plan, which I think you would all agree is significant. One of these four unit blocks will be built within the same width as mine and my neighbor to the north property combined. My house is roughly 1,240 square feet. Over the weekend, I stood in the land behind my house and just envisioned four of my houses attached together, occupying that small space built on raised land. It was daunting and saddening to know that this could be my view going forward, rather than the current trees, field, and the hills beyond the river in the distance. I moved to Frankfurt from a subdivision in Trenton four years ago to be surrounded by more nature, and now that will be gone. We understand that there is a housing issue right now. However, the issue locally is more with the affordability of houses than the number of houses available. With the size of these units, they would likely be priced at or above the average price of houses in the area, which are unaffordable for most. This proposed plan seems to be more about fitting as many houses as possible on the least amount of land possible for the highest profit than it is to be creating a truly affordable house. I believe we would be less opposed to the zoning change if the plan had less density and more spacing between each group of townhouses. Perhaps building single dwellings on the east side of Patrick Drive and townhouse, sorry, on the areas east of Patrick Drive and townhouses on the southern part of Windover Street or eliminating one block of four townhouses east of Patrick Drive and the single townhouse at the southern part of Wind Windover Street where it will connect to Patrick Drive. Again, we aren't opposed to the land being developed, just the proposed density and taking s away so much of the green, green space and how it will affect the groundwater. The council before us today were elected by the public and part of your role is, and I quote, to represent the public and consider the well-being and interests of the municipality. We ask that you hear our outcries and concerns and take into consideration how building out the proposed density, essentially taking away all of the nature and replacing with it with pavement, shingles, brick and siding, is not only going to increase the likelihood of flooding in an already oversaturated area, but also affect our quality of life and change the feel of the community around us that we love. Please help us avoid having to go through the appeal process, do the job that you are elected to do and stand with us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your presentation. Um, I'm going to ask staff, uh, and I know, uh, Katie, you read off uh, the, the concerns that had been brought up before in the other meeting, and I, I know it was reiterated here that none of them has been met. Uh, it appeared that way to me in, in, the, in the presentation. Uh, and I believe, uh, I know the city's going to do some upgrades and some work on March Street, uh, and maybe you could address uh, the stormwater management and uh, what has to take place there so it does not in, encroach or in, impede any uh, abutting properties or neighboring properties. So, uh, and then we'll, we'll move on uh, from there to, for more questions. But if you'd like to address maybe what has been presented, please. Yeah, through Mr. Chair, perhaps on that, on that question, because I think the, the um, while well, those, and thank you for the presentation, there's a whole range of things here. There's, there's some of them are engineering and some of them are, are planning. And I think we spoke last time um, uh, to the, the whole idea of, of efficient use of land. And you, the, the presentation stated about, you know, uh, uh, trying to, it appears like there's uh, an attempt to place as many houses on as, as small a piece of land as possible. And, and to an extent, that's right. Um, and that is part of the goal, and that's part of the greater planning goals for the municipality in this area, in Frankfurt, uh, in Trenton, and in all other municipalities to try and make the best efficient use of land. Um, so, 
is finding the balance point of where, where that story mix. Now, definitely, um, the one inter interesting thing historically about this, and, and I don't need to tell the residents uh, that are here, um, when you look at a plan of the area and you look at the, the, the layout of the road allowances and stuff, the the, the intent was always to develop this land, and I, I don't think the, the community is arguing with that. I think it's the, the scale of development. From a planning standpoint, uh, and, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself from last time, from a standing planning standpoint, the, the differential between townhomes and single detached is, is really not a, an incompatibility issue from a planning perspective. They're all low density homes, and, and Katie spoke to the density, it's still within the, the low density uh, uh, categories for the municipality. Definitely when you're in a situation where you've had empty vacant property beside you, uh, for a number of years, uh, the very uh, 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 creation and development of a building there changes uh, your surroundings. It does, um, but it's not an incompatible land use, and it doesn't. It's not a rationale from a planning perspective to to stop that development from happening. That's kind of the, the, the kind of planning comments on that, but uh, I, I won't try and attempt to uh, speak to or, or pay planning staff to speak to the engineering aspects of the groundwater aspect. I would, uh, I would, I would uh, ask the, the uh, consultant to, to talk about that because that was one of the, the big messages about the, the current situation. I think there was some comments at the, the previous meeting about the style of development and, and its implications on the bedrock and therefore groundwater, um, but I would defer that uh, th those comments to the engineer if, uh, if they were willing to make a response to that. Okay, Arnold, would you wish to uh, maybe address uh, those concerns and that maybe a future design and how you're going to manage that? I'll put it that way. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, from the planning perspective, I think uh, Brian answered most of those issues. Engineering perspective, I felt we'd already had covered our resubmission of information was our response to what we had heard at the last public meeting. We did uh, have Camium there at that process for doing the geotechnical work. Um, there were two issues I think were brought forth. One was the, sort of the flood line mapping, uh, the flood area uh, mapping for uh, Cole Creek, and then the groundwater situation. There was a datum discrepancy uh, that was confirmed and resolved with uh, Lower Trent and access uh, on March Street is readily available for emergency vehicles to get in. It's very close to the surface of the, of the road at the present, even in a regional storm event. Uh, so th that was resolved. The groundwater we felt, um, as most people know, I think most of these houses are, existing houses are also probably built close to bedrock. Um, we found the groundwater following the top of the bedrock uh, and was draining more from the, uh, so, uh, from the, get my bearings here now, from the east to the west towards the property. Um, the whole intent uh, with this development is fully serviced. It will have a uh, storm sewer system in, in installed. It will also probably be providing stormwater quality treatment before it would leave the site. Um, we are also installing rear yard uh, catch basins to intercept all the surface water that is coming either off of this development or coming onto this uh, property and is being directed into the storm sewer and into through the uh, treatment uh, unit that's being installed into Coal Creek. So all our work, the sanitary sewer is constructed into bedrock. It would be trenched, it would be hole rammed, um, and we're responsible for that. Uh, the storm sewer will be inter intercepting most of the surface water, under surface water, let's call it, that's following the layer of bedrock. Um, the intent of these houses, we don't want to go into bedrock. We're not going to build them in a bathtub. Um, uh, so we want to keep them up. Uh, we don't want to infringe into the neighborhood. The, it's a low density development as far as we're concerned. Uh, you, we could have used a larger lot, put very large white houses on it. We'd almost have and make them two-story and have a bigger impact than what we're now doing with a story and a half split units that are being proposed with the townhouses. Um, so I think we've addressed pretty well all the concerns. To create more green space, who's going to take care of it? You have to have a minimum amount of park land basically to be usable for and maintained by the municipality. Our feeling is we should be more to make a contribution to more open space areas that it would be function for the full neighborhood. There is the Memorial Arena already in that area that's technically open space, recreational use as well. The trail system is there. 
we can't resolve the issue. We can help the city resolve the issue of pedestrian traffic on March Street. Um, I, I, I think they never really came back to us and advised what upgrades they will be doing, but I think there is some potential at some point to make sure there is sort of some separation distance between uh, vehicle traffic and pedestrian movement, uh, uh, walkers on the road going to the trail system. So I do believe what the intent of this plan, it is low density development. We are going to be probably addressing the <coughs> groundwater situation through the infrastructure that's being built. We're addressing the surface water runoff. And I think it's a good use for, uh, for developing the property uh, for the cost that's associated with putting in a full urban service subdivision. If we eliminated sidewalks, eliminated curbs, put a road in and ditches, I think we would have probably a, a lower standard of development. Uh, it is townhouses that's being proposed. They're freehold townhouses, individually owned. And I think the size and the range that would be, I would say, more expensive than the existing detached houses in the area, but still in the affordable range. If we had to go back to detached houses, we're going to be seeing more very expensive houses, which then become a marketing situation that would have to be addressed for Frankfurt, I think. So I think it's a good use for the area. It provides a buffer for the industrial building that's to the south that we had to deal with as well. And I think the Conservation Authority are satisfied that we've dealt well with the stormwater issue as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Arnold. Okay, before I ask the committee to uh, uh, consider this, and uh, are there any other questions? Uh, please come forward at this time, please. State your name and address for the record, please. My name is Don Beath, yep. 87 March Street, Frankfurt. Okay. The engineer of Amir states that the foundations will be above the rock bed and groundwater. That's what we read through the report. How high are they going to build it up? You've got to put storm sewers in minimum four feet below the ground level. Right now, the rock bed's sitting at about two feet. So it raises it up the hills. You're going to have to drive up Clover to get, or not Clover, Windover to get onto the roads. If they're going to build it up, that's going to increase water flow through ground. Again, it's going to affect the bedrock and the water tables. If they're going to put in swales, swales should not be more than 15% slope. If they raise it up, I assure you there's going to be more than a 15% slope. Where's the water going to go? Into the backyards of our people. Now, they talk about putting in, what do you call that thing? It's a grid separator. That has to go a minimum of four feet depth, again, into the bedrock. Averting ground table, ground water tables. Okay. The investigation by Cambium recommend the construction occurred during drier months. I've lived at 87 March Street for 30 years. I would like to see those drier months. Does that mean instead of two feet of water, they can work in one foot? I don't know if you've ever been back there. I believe Jared has. Now, traffic. The traffic study on March. Yes, it's telling them that doesn't warrant a left-hand turn from Highway 33. Well, when we were talking, we were stipulating Marsh Street's not wide enough. If you get a bus, come to the stop sign or a bigger vehicle, truck. Nobody can get in, make a left-hand turn coming from Trenton or a right-hand turn coming from Frankfurt in town. If they can't get in. They have to let the vehicle go by. It's not wide enough. The Now... Okay. Our biggest issue is the water. It always has been. We've learned to contain it. 
We learn to work with it. But the changes in the bedrock, changes in the ground table, groundwater table, is going to affect us. It's going to affect everybody in that area. Would you want to purchase a house there? When we have received a letter from the insurance company of one of our residents, as per the Dominion of Canada General Insurance Company, habitational, 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 okay, sorry, rate, manual, the postal code KOK2CO does not fall into a geographical zone where the flood water rider would be applicable. So they're saying they're going to get increase your rates or you'd be lucky if you get flood insurance. Now, the developer has filed all the guidelines set up by the municipality. Guidelines do not always perform well within certain areas. And I can assure you that these guidelines will not perform well for the existing residents in this development. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I will add again, the city has proposed to do an upgrade to March Street. I think it's going to, I think it was in the budget for this year, as I recall, and it hasn't changed. Uh, I haven't seen the design, but I'm sure it'll be brought up to uh, today's standard. So uh, that that is in the works. So anyway, uh, we'll take one more uh, presentation and uh, we'll have to uh, move on because there's another part of this that we have to uh, deal with also. Christopher Hain, 81 March Street, the corner of March and Windover. Mr. Chair, committee members, 2000, I believe in nine, I came to the council at the time and they were sitting up here when the property was for sale. And it was promised to me by the council, Keith Reed was on in that time, that the storm sewer water would drain off of Wool Street not the Cold Creek. Jimmy Turner, one of your employees, lives just on March Street. He's been blasting for probably 2010 to 2020 until you guys put some money in the Cold Creek to get the flow. Until 2019, people on the committee had basements flooded, businesses flooded in their business, the Massos and all that stuff because of the water. What's going to stop that in March in the thaw when there's fragile ice building up on the mouth there? Sure, we're going to say we're going to blast it. Sure, we're going to do it. Why are we putting the cart before the horse? Why not we fix it first, let it go off Wool Street like was promised, let it drain properly off of Wool Street lower, let it go down south, not north. Right now you're pushing water north the Cold Creek. Why? Each of you own property. Each of you have an investment someplace. Mem Mayor Jim Harrison just said for him, he, they can put 250 houses in this 10 acre. I know. That's what you say. Well, that's, that's, what, that's what you say now, but we thought it would never happen either. Okay? We, we, never thought four, we never thought 28 homes. We thought maybe 11. Okay? We never thought it never happened. It's happening, so don't say never, okay? So we each have a property. If your basement cracks because of the, the jackhammering or whatever have, they have to do, right? You're gonna fix it, they're gonna fix it. They're gonna put a band -aid. It's like you're breaking an arm and it fractures, right? It heals. Where do you get arthritis? In that arm. It's never gonna be the same. It'll never be the same. It's not like it was. We just are protecting our investment, just like each and every one of you guys would protect your investment. It's like the neighbor said, we voted for you guys to do what's right. We're not against building homes. We're not against property, right? We're against putting the cart before the horse. Fix March Street, put sidewalks in, do all the right stuff first, then go ahead and talk about it when it's done. If you were at the Junior C hockey game this winter when they went to the playoffs, you couldn't find a parking spot up March Street. 
I'd be, excuse my language, damned if you could get a fire truck up March Street. And it's not no, pro, no fault of their own, people had to park, right? And it's good for the residents and the, and the community to have all those things. Right? But we're just, we see that every day. We see the water in the springtime. You guys don't see it, we see it. It's our sump pump. It's my $10,000 generac that's going on. When Hydro says, well, we're gonna shut the power off on Sunday from seven o'clock in the morning till two, right? Who's gonna fix my basement? That cost me already twice $10,000 each time to fix it. Who? I have to come out of pocket. My insurance company, they won't cover it. But thank you very much for your time. And, and uh, good luck, you know. And no, I, like I said, we're not against the development. We just want to make sure that you don't put the cart before the horse. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, if there are no other comments at this time, uh, I'm going to ask to open it up to the committee here to uh, ask any questions and make a re there is my recommendation here to uh, uh, accept the revised, uh, I guess, amendment. And it's, uh, there's about 39, uh, I guess, uh, uh, sections to it here, uh, portions, and it's not, not short uh, on, on the recommendations. So. Um, anyway, uh, I'll leave it to the committee to do at their discretion how they want to deal with this. But there is a recommendation to accept the revised red line amendment. And then the next uh, part we'll be dealing with is the zoning bylaw amendment, which is part of this also. So. Well, no, I, I'd just like to ask uh, the engineer to tell us how they're going to deal with the water Obviously, the excess, a large amount of water on March Street. How are you going to deal with it? Not what you're going to build to deal with it, I mean, in terms of housing, but how do you propose to deal with the water before you do any housing? I guess that's, that's my question. Mr. Chair, so, Mr. Mayor Harrison, you're talking about the existing groundwater that's sitting on the surface now before we start construction or during construction? Well, I, I, I assume, but I, I'm not, I don't yeah. know. All right. Assume. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. No, well, the, 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 what I was hearing from the gentleman was that um, how are we dealing with the groundwater and the construction? I had given it, I thought I was was indicating that the houses that we're building, the yes. foundations are staying above the bedrock. Yes. Our storm sewers are not above the bedrock. We are basically be trenching in rock. The sanitary sewers and the water main are going into the bedrock as well. So in effect, we're not raising, having a minimum depth of storm sewer and then raising the buildings up higher. We've done the full engineering for this, uh, for the subdivision and the existing ground, we're matching existing ground at all the adjacent properties. We're putting a swale in that's eight inches deep. We're bringing a catch basin to these swales because we're only allowed to have no more than about 10 houses, rear yards connecting into a catch basin. So we're, all that surface water and some of that groundwater that's running below uh, above the rock will get intercepted into that storm sewer uh, into well, the surface water into the catch basin and some groundwater we can intercept into our subdrain system and bring the water table slightly down which is not really what the conservation authority wants us to be doing and then it's going into a storm sewer and the grading and the drainage of three quarters of that property is towards the north to Cold Creek. Uh, there's no way we could make a connection going to the south uh, toward, toward Wolf Street. Only the very uh, south end of uh, Patrick Drive, that area, was being directed originally. It was draining across the property and through a bit of a ditch, and it almost got blocked, I guess, where the, where the industrial factory is right now. So most of the, we're picking up all the water, and it's the surface water and the ditching water is going off of Patrick Street, is going into the storm sewers, and then we have to take it around and get it to Coal Creek. The, Direction of stormwater, uh, the peak flows of Coal Creek happen much later than when the peak flow from this development leaves this property. So when the high runoff comes out of the subdivision, when that storm happens, it'll already been into Coal Creek and be into the Trent River before that peak flow that is coming down Coal Creek from that larger catchment area. So 
From that basis, the storm water is getting rid of. Some of the groundwater is being lowered as well and getting into the storm sewer through the sub drains that we're putting in. And we're not raising everything up as sort of insinuated. Yes, the pipes are into, into the rock, but the houses are not because uh, the foundations are, are basically at rock or above rock. Uh, we have more uh, earth cover at the south end of the property than we do at the north end. But, uh, and then any water that's being received during construction is being collected and pumped and is putting into uh, sediment traps before it's allowed to discharge. So we're also doing our erosion and sediment controls as well. Um, I believe the house uh, on the uh, w west side of Windover Street on the south, and maybe that's where the owner lives, I didn't have the address, but that's a low area in there as well. Um, we're putting actually a catch basin in on the, in on the boulevard uh, within the development to re receive that low area. That house itself is quite high, but the yards around it is, are low, uh, but we're matching in very close to it. Uh, we're building up our boulevards and matching ground and then putting catch basins in for any low areas where water could possibly be trapped by our grading of the subdivision, um, we're intercepting that, putting it into the pipe, which is lower and out to Cold Creek. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think I think you've um, you know certainly uh, alluded to my point. My point is that obviously water is a big issue there before you even come here. Yeah. So you've got to make every effort as a developer to mitigate the water situation that's there before you start. Yeah doing anything so that that's that's what you're alluding to not, i know, not I know to you're telling you, me that as the engineer yeah i have a, engineer, i think a bigger liability yeah. than the developer does uh, yeah. the developer will be posting a five million dollar liability insurance and all the work is being monitored during construction as well so if there are issues that are, are occurring there's no blasting happening but uh, there is a noise effect some vibration effect happening with uh, uh, hole ramming operations especially uh, well, I think a person that I think we left the meeting the other time he said down on the project there was hole ramming and uh, uh, a plate fell off the wall that they had from hole ramming, which if, if we did a vibration test, we wouldn't even know a vibration, but noise and sound vibrations you can even feel quite often on windows have effect houses as well. So, But uh, they will be monitored, and if there is an issue, there will the municipality be, be ensuring that the developer and ourselves will be addressing any deficiencies and incidents that occur. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Anyone else uh, wish to make comment? Uh, Councilor uh, McHugh. Yeah, I just have a question while, while you're still there, please. Um, I visited there, I think it was last November, just after the last meeting, and heard some of the concerns and walked around. And, no, and it, we're talking water, lots, lots of water. There was water there then. Um, you talked about some of these other catch basins you're putting in at different locations. If I'm hearing you correctly, you're looking after all the water that's on your site, which is all you're really responsible for. But are these other catch basins you're putting in, is there some illusion here that they may be helping some of the drainage for the existing houses that are there? Yes. Um, we are responsible not only for water on our property. We don't want the water from our site to run off onto somebody else's property. But we also can't block water coming onto our property. So the swales on the... <coughs> Property boundaries are basically, be, I would say, somewhere between eight inches to 12 inches below existing ground, and have somewhere between uh, one percent and sometimes as low as a half percent slope on them. If we are below one percent, uh, even then we will put a sub drain in them as well, to, because you can only grade to at a half percent. There's very little fall across 50 feet, um, so we put a sub drain in to make sure that they stay dry as well. So. In effect, at the property boundary, we're probably lowering the groundwater table at the property line by about 15 inches to 18 inches uh, and intercepting in the subdrain that goes into the storm sewers. So we're receiving surface water and we're trying to also receive as much of the groundwater that's running just above the bedrock. Just to follow up, there were some other concerns with some improvements that the city could do in that area, not so much the street, but with the water runoff as well, depending on where it's going. Will we be doing follow-up on that? Any other, is there any other work planned in that area to address any water issues that may 
that the city can handle or look after? Well, that's what I was wondering, Councillor, uh, and through to Brian, that maybe if when the design comes for the rebuild of that street, then I'm not sure when they're going to start. I'm not even sure the tender's been done, but maybe it's out. But um, I'm sure the, uh, the, the, I guess, engineering design for that street and what it's, the finish is going to look like, uh, will uh, you could pass that along, I'm quite sure. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we'll definitely pass that along, and we have a member of engineering staff here this evening as well. Um, uh, with respect to the design, as is, is, is everybody knows, when when the city uh, redesigns or, or reconstructs a road, the, the drainage of the road and the, the, the road allowance um, is part of that design uh, to make sure that it doesn't uh, either create or, or exacerbate a situation, and in fact, it should improve existing situation. As for blasting uh, in an existing creek system that the city is doing, that's a conversation we'll have to take back to, to Mr. Turner and uh, see if that's something that's going to be alleviated by this Marsh Street design. Uh, I, can't, I can't comment on that at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, Chair, one thing I didn't mention is there is a roadside ditch on March Street on the south side, and we are also picking that up into the storms. It's coming off Patrick Drive, coming along March Street towards Wendover Street, and we'll be installing a catch basin at that intersection as well as part of the design, uh, and then that discharges as well through the pipe systems that are sized and into that existing drainage course that's going towards Cold Creek. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, Mike. Council Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's been alluded to, but I don't think the question's been fully answered. I know the one gentleman asked it. Why is it that March Street cannot be upgraded and then the development take place in that order? I don't know. Uh, to Mr. Chair, so there, there obviously is, is uh, as members of the committee know, two, two different projects. So we've got a city capital works project for upgrading of, 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 of city roads and, uh, and services, and then private development that taps into that. The, the only rationale that the city would have to, to, to hold a development um, uh, prior to a capital project of that sort would be if the city is not comfortable that the development can be accommodated by that road system as it stands right now. Um, that's not the case in this situation. This, uh, the, the, the traffic information has been provided and, and been reviewed. Um, while there's definitely room for improvement and there's area, existing uh, road systems all, all around our, our, our urban areas that, that are due for upgrades, intersections that could perform better. Um, so there might be times such as a, a hockey final or something like that where you get lots of traffic and, 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 and an issue, but we don't always look we can't always look at those types of instances. It, it's more the uh, the general situation. So if this was a situation where March Street could not accommodate this development, then yes, we'd be looking at what upgrades would need to be done and we'd have, we would have a justification for withholding or holding the development. But that's not the case in this situation. Definitely the March Street... March Street project will improve the situation, but it, it uh, from a staff perspective, it should not hold up this development. Okay, come on. And thank you. And then for the, regarding the planning meeting that took place in November, I wasn't on that committee. I, I came in the new year. Just for clarification from purposes, please. Uh, have the numbers actually went down at all? Could they stand to perhaps drop some of these four proposed units to three, like block eight, seven, and six that are a bit smaller and three and two and keep the four units in four and five? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the, the, the question is, uh, uh, I don't want to be too blunt, but the question is why? Um, so, uh, could they? That's a, that's a developer's call. I mean, we, we have to respond to the, to the development proposal that we get. Um, if this development was over the density limit, then yeah, we, we could be asking for that, or it would require a different form of applications, like the one earlier on this evening, but that's not the case. The, the developer's staying within all of the parameters. Uh, there's no justification for the city asking that. Uh, of the developer okay not pertaining to the just the water issue not pertaining to the actual density yeah, but the actual get, water they I, can handle again, all those yeah again through to you mr chair i think you know i, I think the, the the there's been a lot of good information from uh, mr van Meer, but um the the, the general premise is that the, the development needs to, to capture and, and manage its own water. And in fact, I think the, the, the reality, and I don't want to make too blunt a statement and, and uh, dumb down engineering in any way, but, but um, you know, a municipal system that captures the water and, 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 and flows it away operates much better and clears water out of a, an existing area much quicker and much more efficiently than an existing area that's a rural serve that you're relying on groundwater penetration 
in and um, uh, in roadside ditches. So um, this development uh, will, is definitely mandated to manage all of its own water and the water that it receives. And based on the fact that it's a municipal system, it should actually improve the overall area. Councillor Crimson. Thanks very much. Um, just for not only my purposes, but anybody else who might have the same question, what is an oil grit separator and how does it work? Number one question, I have others. Nobody knows? Unit, sorry, the unit that we're proposing, it's basically an oversized manhole. Uh, just as for description, it would, I think this one is uh, 1.8 meters in diameter. It would probably be going, constructed, it'd be about 10 feet, 12 feet into the ground. And it works on sort of a centrifugal effect. It receives the water and has screens inside it. It runs the water in a circle and it basically drives the grit and the sediment to the outside to drop down uh, to a, a, a catchment area, a, a, a sump in the, underneath this where the flow of the water is. And these units are cleaned out what, once a year. Um, they've, they've been designed uh, and used in many municipalities. Uh, I think Bal Trenton has some as well. Uh, but basically they, they are sort of a, a, has an internal structure that helps draw the sediment down and the units are designed that it takes, uh, well, getting technical here, but it's called a, a 50 micron particle, very fine. And it's supposed to remove up to 80% of them during a, a quality storm event. So that's what we're doing. We're basically cleaning the water. Uh, set, instead of a big uh, pond, which is allowed to let the water come in at one end and slowly seep out the other end and settle down, um, this uh, unit is now in a compacted uh, format, does uh, the same effect. Uh, of treatment and it's much easier to clean out than to come in eight years or once every eight to ten years and excavate out of a sump hole a bunch of uh, silt that's been collected. But So it's, uh, it's a standard that uh, is established by the Ministry of Environment. It's a higher standard than that was put forth uh, um, for this area. Uh, it's an enhanced treatment that's required because we're on the Bay of Quinney and a, a water source as well. Uh, uh, protection source. So that's what's been proposed, designed to remove 80% of the sediment in a structure. And in this uh, design that you have, where is the oil grit separator going to be located on your? It'll be at the intersection of March Street and Windover Street. So it's on municipal property. Yes. So the municipality is actually going to be cleaning it out. Yes. Then. That's then, a standard um, process. The next question has to do. You mentioned about a swale. Where on your design that you have here is the swale, or if you are uh, looking one? at the townhouse blocks, I can't read the numbers. The ones that are running north and south, the four blocks, um, it's running inside the property on within the development. Uh, we can't put it on the property line, but it would be following the, that back the rear yards of those three blocks. And if you look at it, uh, I think between the most northerly block. And the second block down, there's uh, dashed lines between it. That's an easement yes, yes. to bring a catch basin to the rear yard. And so the b north block will have a uh, swale that would be grainy, graded towards the south of the catch basin. And the other three blocks would be graded to the north along the rear yard into that catch basin. And then along the side yard of the northerly block townhouse, <laughs> the northerly townhouse there block, uh, we would have a catch basin just inside the property line to receive the low area uh, of the backyards of the two houses that are fronting on March Street. Uh, there'd also be a swale in the back, along the backyard of um, the townhouses that run east and west as well. And then um, uh, I, I live in an area where uh, the land is quite flat, similar to this, and so in my experience, a 1% grade on an open swale is the water's not going to move. It, it will it will just stagnate there, uh, especially after 
uh, a number of seasons of property maintenance. Like you cut the grass and the wind blows and the trees lose their leaves and uh, the material is gonna build up quickly. So who's going to be maintaining an open swale uh, after these properties are uh, sold and built and all that sort of stuff? Is that just up to the property owner? Yes. I, one thing you're bringing forth now here, you're commenting on slopes on uh, swales, 1% uh, and waters that can stay stagnant into them. We're also yeah. being asked now to try to improve the situation, that what they call low impact development. And we're trying to keep water on the lots uh, and not pushing it out into uh, uh, yeah. steep slopes, swales, into storm sewers. So That's we're doing too. a little balance there. Um, but when we're down to the 1% and less, we're actually putting a sub drain in, so you have, we're creating a French drain in that swale. Right. So when you have those imperfections in that flat slope, any low depressions, the water should be draining down, going into the sub drain, then to the catch basin, into a storm sewer. So underneath the swale is is a, is a drain under that. Yes. That's going to go towards. You know, the one example is where you have your. Um, uh, your uh, easement, I guess, uh, and well, not really an easement, but a, a spot where you're going to have the uh, water going to be coming towards the Windover Street yes. that will then go into the municipal stormwater system. So, so how many how many drains going into um, like uh, like from your swale into the drain underneath the swale, how many uh, openings or spots will there be for the water to get in there? Like, is there is there one at each resident, or is there one per building, or is there just one period? Um, you know well, yet? the swale is in the backyard. Uh, there'll be no connections to the swale. But what we are doing is we're providing a storm sewer lateral. We're providing a water service lateral, a sanitary service lateral. And we're also installing a storm sewer service lateral to the property line and then the sump pump or they will, can be extended by gravity up to the building. And then the sump pumps that are discharging uh, from the basements, they will be, there will be sump pumps installed. We're keeping them up so technically they shouldn't be running, but there's provision for it and the sump pump will discharge into the storm sewer building lateral and not onto the surface as well. So we're putting that water into a, the storm sewer system. So the, uh, normally roof leaders are not done. They would be, uh, the roof water coming down the leaders would be seated over the grass. And the slopes on the backyards are usually running about 5%, 4 to 5%. Right. So that water is being sheeted across the backyard, sort of being treated, like, uh, yeah. touching yeah, the debris through the, the grass, yeah. into the swale, and then into the storm sewer. That was all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? And other than that, I would ask that uh, I, I receive direction on how you want to work with this recommendation of the revision of the red line amendment. Entertain a motion or what's your wishes? I'll move the recommendation. Okay. Move by Mayor Harrison. Do we have a seconder to put it on the floor for a vote? All right. I'm going to second it. Okay. So we're going to move and second it that the red, the red line amendment be accepted and re, as in the revised manner. And that's page and a half. I'm not going to read it all. And uh, um, are there any other concerns or questions? Mr. Before Mr. I call the vote, one more question. Go one on. more question. Okay, Mr. to Mr. Jardine. So, uh, currently, all of the um, criteria that you've listed out in here all meets the city's official plan, and your planning staff is recommending that we go ahead uh, uh, with the uh, amendments that have been made, and uh, your staff obviously comfortable that all of the um, conditions that were spoken about at the public meeting uh, have been addressed uh, to the best of the city's ability and the planning the planning act and the city's official plan 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I would confirm that that's, that's the city's uh, uh, planning position at this point. I would also remind the committee that uh, this approval comes with a, a significant set of uh, conditions that have to be, be met, including full engineering design, uh, as, as kind of uh, spoken to this evening, uh, before final approval is given. So, But yes, we are uh, recommending approval uh, of the application this evening. Thank you. There's no further comment, and it's been regularly moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Forsey, go ahead. Uh, it's just what people say, like, 30 years there's been a water problem in this neighborhood, and it seems like we're, we're putting the onus on the developer to get rid of everybody's water. And if there's plans to do an upgrade on the street, well, how are we not dealing with these people's water issues in, in, on the street and the yards? You know, we're here, they can't get insurance. It just seems odd to me that it just seems odd to me that there's planned projects and we're not doing dealing with the water that's collecting on these streets like I'm hearing surface water. I think you have to, Mr. Chair, through you, so you have to remember that the city deals with city property and we are not involved in private property. This, this particular development was done with uh, what you'd call Frankfurt Zone 2 uh, development. There was um, no zone... Site plan approval? Zone one and zone two, and that's that's when it was done. But I, what we're saying here with the, you know, um, the engineer, is that yes, there is a water problem there that's been there for yes, 30 years, and it needs to be corrected. And so Mr. Vandermeer has said to us and to all the owners there that he is uh, certainly going to do with the developer everything that he can do. To, to correct the water situation that exists there now. And that that's, uh, he hasn't gone out on a limb and said that he, you know, till death do us part, but we're gonna hold him to that firewall that, to make sure that what he's telling us is going to happen. I think what he said though is any water that comes on to that development from- No, no I, 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 believe I so. understand what you're, where you're coming from, yeah, but yeah. he's got, he has stated that they will correct the situation that exists there, and they're going to build the houses above, above the the water level, so that they, you know. In, but, but he'll correct the in, in the, theory. They'll That's, correct the backyard is, issue. Well, listen, I. <laughs> yeah. JD. JD. Hey. Uh, I don't have to drive over there. I live there too. I, I, I'm one of your neighbors. You might see me walking my baby uh, early in the morning. You can wave and say hi if you want. I'm a nice guy, I think, anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, so I want to echo my concerns over March Street. I used to live at 44 March Street until uh, 12 years ago. Now I live um, at the end of Diamond Street. And uh, yeah, I, I walk March Street sometimes twice a day, at least every day. Um, and it is, I would say it's narrow and I'm not exactly sure where you would put a sidewalk, but especially with this, uh, with this development, and I know we talked about this and it's going to be done, but I just want to, uh, chime in on that because I got a lot of skin in this game. I got uh, three kids. Um, and it, it, it is a concern to me that, you know, nearly 30 residences are going up. We need them. It took me almost two years to get a place in Frankfurt. Um, but I am a little concerned over, Mar Mar Street was a bit of a problem when I lived there years ago. Um, it is narrow, especially by the arena. That's a treacherous corner to come around. It really is uh, when, when there's a hockey game going on. And uh, yeah, you even walking sometimes, you know, I really gotta uh, watch my steps. So uh, I, 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 I know it's in the, uh, it's in the process, but uh, I'd like to see sooner than later something happen to make March Street a little safer uh, for, uh, for traffic and especially for pedestrians. That's all I wanted to chime in on, thank you. Okay, committee, we, we have a, a motion on the floor to uh, support the staff recommendation. All of those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. We now move to 11.3, staff report 23-066 PD, 
Zoning bylaw amendment. The owner is 1210641 Ontario Limited. Owner operator is uh, Diamond Homes. Their agent is Van Meer Limited. Arnold Van Meer is the representative. The location is Wendover Street. The file number is D09 slash F19 slash 22. Katie, would you address this uh, zoning bylaw amendment, please? Through you, Mr. Chair, application D09 slash F19 slash 22 applies to land owned by Diamond Homes located on Wendover Street in the city of Quinney West. The statutory public meeting for this application was held in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act on Thursday, November the 3rd, 2022. This application proposes to rezone the subject lands from residential type two zone to the residential type three zone and residential type three exception 20 zone to permit the proposed development. The residential type three zone requires a minimum lot area of 230 square meters and a minimum lot frontage of six meters for townhouse development. The proposed lot configuration on the draft plan of subdivision complies with the lot provisions for the residential type three zone. Under the residential type three zone provisions for a single detached dwelling, the minimum lot area is 370 square meters and 12 meters of frontage with a maximum lot coverage of 45%. Lot one on the draft plan of subdivision located at the south end of Patrick Drive is shown to be for a single detached dwelling. And it also appears in compliance with these provisions, having an area of 609 square meters and 18 meters of frontage. However, the proposed lot coverage is 50%. Therefore, the single detached dwelling on lot one would require to be rezoned to the residential type three exception 20 zone to recognize the lot coverage. The provincial policy statement and the city's official plan policies support a range of housing types within the settlement areas and the efficient uses of lands and services. The application is consistent with the provincial policy statement, the city's official plan, and maintains the, in the intent of the zoning bylaw. This application is recommended for approval. Okay, thank you very much. I, I know we've addressed it, uh, the previous uh, concerns, and this is just a zoning bylaw amendment. Is there any other concerns regarding this? If not, I would ask the committee to uh, consider it. But come forward, please. This is just going back to, sorry, I'm Susan Hansel at 10 Factor Drive. Um, going back to the stormwater management where, where they're saying they're going to be collecting all, all this water and treating it from, from our properties and not, right in their management it says, um, the proposed development will be designed to reduce runoff towards the south, allowing the southern drainage to remain untreated and uncontrolled, similar to the existing conditions. So they're not planning to treat all the water, only portion of this property. The rest, they're saying it's going to remain as it is. I just wanted to bring that into attention. Thank you. Would you like to address that, uh, Arnold? Uh, you have a better idea of the lay of the land and what your design is. Please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just to clarify, there was a lay area on the south portion coming off Patrick Street that drained towards the, the south through the, I forget what the industrial name is now, um, but now with the buildings being constructed and the front yards and we had to redesign the development to connect uh, Patrick Street to Windover Street, all the front yards, the roof drainage, everything is being directed towards Windover Street. So the effect is that the backyards is a much smaller runoff area than there was what we call pre-development situation. So it was a very small amount of water that was being redirected, uh, will now be redirected to the south than what was going there originally. So technically we were less than what the pre-development condition was. So, but everything within the subdivision, the rooftops, uh, the driveways, the front yards are all being directed uh, towards uh, Windover Street and are going through the treatment system. Okay, thank you. Does that answer some of your concerns? Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Any, anyone else make a comment? If not, I would ask the committee to entertain the recommendation or any questions, uh, Councillor McHugh. I have a question, maybe staff can explain this to me on page seven, Lower Trent Conservation Authority. What is a flood proofing permit, please? Yeah. 
<laughs> because of the uh, regional flood designation, we redefine the regional flood des designation on the property. Um, it goes around the developments, uh, but because of that situation, the conservation authority also has a permitting requirement. So we're, when we are in the 100-year flood zone, going to the regional level, we're in that area you're allowed to build, and in that regional area, that fringe area, uh, we have to get permits recognized by the conservation authority. So there's a permitting process with them as well. When you're in the front, when you're in that fringe zone between the 100 year event and the regional event, uh, regional event being a Timmins storm, uh, then they expect that area to have a permit be applied for with them as well. Just before you leave, uh, Mr. Chair, yep. you know, you know I, I understand what you're saying, but uh, let's, I'm building the house, okay, and, I, and I'm in, in a zone where I've got to have special, you know, permits from the lower trend to, to flood proof my home. That's what you're talking about, correct? Yes. Yes. So, so what, 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 what can I do? What modifications can I make to my home with the permits that will flood proof my home besides put it on stilts? <laughs> well, basically, uh, there's different options, I guess. Uh, if you have the, the space, you would put a dike around your property to make sure the regional storm stays outside that area, doesn't come in. Um, all these houses that we're doing, uh, we are ensuring that any openings uh, in the uh, to the basement, let's say, are above the point, uh, 0.3 meters above the regional flood level in case there's any wave action. And that's the biggest criteria. Any openings in that have to be above it. And if you have water around it, you also structurally design it to make sure it will withstand those forces as well. But that's where the house, you just want to ensure that um, it's a, and they, again, we're dealing with a regional event. Uh, so we're that much higher, about, I'd say 15 inches higher than a 100-year storm event. We would make sure the front doors, any windows in that are above that level. Anyone else? Mr. Harrison. Thank you. The other Mr. Harrison, no relation. <laughs> Dan Harrison, uh, Six Patrick Drive. Uh, I would just like to ask, um, has has the developer or anyone uh, asked if uh, insurance is available for these new homes? Because I cannot. And it states in um, that it says KOK2C0 is not eligible for insurance. So, for flood insurance. Can I, so. uh, can I respond? Is our insurance guy here? <laughs> yeah, I'm a licensed insurance broker here in the province of Ontario. Thank you. <laughs> Keep shopping. Is my suggestion. Oh, I realize that uh, there's some places that I can get it. That is correct. But it's going to cost me about six hundred dollars. <laughs> the point is that it's available. You can get it. You have to shop, and in some cases, yes, you're going to have to pay. That is true. And you may have to answer a bunch of questions, too. The insurance company may ask what sort of remediation efforts your home has. But like somebody mentioned about having a generator. That yes, would be, I do have one. That would be a plus in being able to get the flood insurance that you're speaking of. Strange you say that because I asked at the time when I put the generator in, if there was any discount, because I'm not only protecting uh, my food from freezing, my house from freezing, uh, my sump pump from not running, my answer was no. Keep shopping. I guess I'm, I'm with the wrong company, I guess. Well, there's uh, what company are you with? <laughs> shopping <laughs> <laughs> my recommendation is to keep shopping uh, there are lots of markets out there that might give you a discount as you are so forth looking looking for but the other thing is you got to think in terms of risk management for yourself having that generator is um, just another form of insurance oh I realize that so, so I wouldn't leave home without it and it's a great investment to have and every home everybody should have one do I have one no I don't have one but I should get one I've been thinking about it and they can cost anywhere from eight to twenty thousand dollars depending on 
what you want it to do. That's correct. Um, but uh, but that's just another form of insurance for your home that you that you have. Well, I like guess like I said, it's 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 very costly to the homeowner. But worth it in every penny. As far as the terms of the uh, having a generator, it's worth it. And we can talk after if you want. Okay, any other questions or concerns? Uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to raise that. I, I, I'm sure some of you know this, uh, but it's not when I lived here, but the area where there are homes between Diamond Street and Center Street, as I understand it, 40, 50 years ago was all swamp too. Um, so, you know, things can change for the, uh, for the better there. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the sidewalk uh, situation for sure on March Street would, uh, would, have, to be, uh, would have to be addressed. Um, but these, I think these units answer a lot of questions or a lot of problems, I should say. Um, go past Motel 6. Uh, on your way home, and I think you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, certainly helped uh, units like this, certainly helped uh, me get to the city of Quinty West, my family, and uh, um, it's it's difficult hearing all the objections because you're talking about something that, uh, you know, flooding, it's a, I don't want to put anyone in that situation with a vote. Um, but uh, I, I just do want to say that uh, these appear to be nice, uh, nice homes, it's a good opportunity here, and uh, well, I do hear all your concerns, and I thank you for bringing them up because you were also speaking for me um, that uh, my vote will be for it. Uh, but, of course, I uh, just wanted to let you know that I do hear your concerns, um, and uh, they're certainly valid. And I thank you all for coming tonight. Okay. Any other comments? Mr. McHugh, Councilman yeah, McHugh. I'd like to echo some of the comments that uh, Mr. Brown put forward. And we have an excellent staff here. We've got a lot of real good experts on staff, you can rest assured. Whatever happens going forward, they're going to be on this, and we're going to make sure council and this committee, I'm sure, that they are on top of it all. But I know that they're going to handle this, and it's going to be done right, or it won't be done at all, basically. It's going to be done right. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other comments, committee, I would uh, entertain a motion to accept the recommendation and approval. Moved uh, by Mr. Brown, seconded by Council Kinsey. Yeah. Okay, any further questions or comments? If not, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Unanimously. Thank you. We now move on to item 12, uh, printed information. Uh, we have 12.1A, um, the monthly planning report, zoning bylaw, official plan amendment, application tracking, year to date. And then 12.2, the committee minutes and site plan control minutes uh, and the regular meeting of June the 1st. And I believe that's all. So I would entertain any a motion to exceed or any questions regarding those uh, minutes? Well, I'll make the motion, but I do have a question. Okay, uh, moved by Councilor Kunzi. We have a seconder to receive. Uh, Mr. Edison, okay, whatever your question is for a call to vote. Uh, it's on one of these uh, zoning bylaw amendments. So I just got to see the name here. Um, I believe it's Willa Lee. Did I read Willa Lee's name on here somewhere? Willow Lee Holdings Limited, uh, east of 1171 Moira Street. What is their zoning bylaw amendment? Does anybody know? So through you, Mr. Chair, I believe that's on for next meeting on, um, it's a committee of adjustment uh, condition. Was it the exactly. site plan that, that I'm just we'll asking about with? this yeah. one? Yeah. I'm just wondering if it, if it uh, was dealt with the site plan committee, but it hasn't been brought forward to the committee of adjustment or the planning committee. Right. Yep. It's on the tracker. That's right. Okay. So there's right now there's nothing. Is what you're saying? It's in the works, I guess you'd say. Yeah. All right. Okay. So yeah. just keep keep an eye out then. And any other questions? If not, all in favor of receipt. Carried, thank you. And, <laughs> and we have no non printed information. Uh, requests for information. Uh, Gerard, do you have anything tonight? No. Mike? Dave? Nothing. Okay. Mr. Forsyth, any questions or comments? JD? No? 
Mr. Mayor, I guess. Councilor Kunze. Unfortunately, I do have a question because I had an email today from a citizen uh, regarding our short-term rental bylaw. So I have to respond to the resident with the answer regarding where are we with our short-term bylaw? Brian? Short-term rental, sorry. That's a, that's a very short answer. Uh, we're in the same spot we were three years ago. Yeah, the, well, I think the clarification is so the, there is no bylaw currently, as you know. I knew that. Um, and there is no bylaw. The, the question was where are there we is no by, There is no bylaw under preparation. There has been no direction from council to prepare a bylaw for that. So the, it is uh, nowhere. I think, at this the time. Best, at this time. For the subject to further direction from council. Thank you. And I would presume, Brian, that involves the Airbnb situation, which we had a kerfuffle with, I guess you'd say, uh, over the last couple of years yeah. and uh, in that's, certain areas. So that's, it, that's the exact yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. And I think Brian has said that uh, they've pursued it but never carried forth with any recommendation from council or... Yeah, no, I think the... the, the um, the work that we did, I mean, this kind of raised its head in a couple of uh, individual locations, and usually members of council get a call because uh, somebody specifically has a, a neighbouring property that turns into a short-term accommodation, um, and so they have an issue with it or, 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 or an issue arising from it. But the, we looked into it. We looked into the number of, of short-term accommodations that we have, the number, the instance of... Uh, complaints that we have, um, and also, more importantly, the implications of what it would take to enforce a bylaw, which, if you ask any municipality who has put one in place, um, I can almost guarantee they, are, we, they will tell you that they wish they had never touched it, because it's, uh, it's a nightmare to enforce. It's almost impossible to enforce. Um, uh, most of the issues that arise from them, noise and all that kind of stuff, happen after hours, outside of, of office hours. It becomes very difficult to enforce. The, the stat, I think the report I did to council back a few years ago, I think we estimated we would need three or four new staff just to manage that, and it would, it would not pay for itself. It would be... Um, one of those uh, bylaws that you'd wish you'd never, you know, you know that that statement I always make to, to council: never, never, never create a bylaw that you don't want to enforce or you can't enforce. Uh, that's one of them. So that was kind of my recommendation at the time. Councilman, you yeah, just a small follow-up. Maybe the director's telling us right now. Uh, we took the soft approach. We did, and and and. Uh, Chair Elie will tell you we had a lot of complaints going back a couple of years ago uh, in Murray along the water, and uh, we had bylaw or the police visit when the when it occurred, and I think word got around. And correct me if I'm wrong, Director, we went without any complaints last year. So obviously something is working. Yeah, that's a good, very good point. I, I, I'm glad you said that because the well. Uh, I, I mean, certainly we're not doing anything we, we did. We definitely did something. We just didn't put a bylaw in place. Uh, we had we had uh, bylaw staff doing enforcement patrols at the weekends. We, we, we followed up on all the parking things. But more importantly, um, we created a platform where uh, short-term accommodation owners, we tried to create a relationship with them and a contact point. Um, and it didn't work for all of them. Um, but we now have a database for all of the operations and direct contacts. Because that's always the big problem with short-term accommodations is when the, when the operator in owner is not present on the site and it doesn't have an, a, a view on what's happening on a Saturday night when you know they rented it to five people and suddenly there's 20 people there, that type of situation. Um, but we found that when, because uh, these operators for the most part want to run a good operation as well, um, so when we had a direct contact with them, uh, we would contact them directly when there, when there was an issue and it only happened a few times and they took immediate action. So we managed to deal with a lot of the issues without putting a bylaw in place. So that was, that's been successful to date. Set aside, uh, Councillor. Okay. You know exactly how you want to word your reply. Okay. <laughs> we, won't, we won't ask you what it is word for word. So if you don't show up sometime, we'll know you didn't answer right. But anyway, we'll, yeah, thank be, you very much. I'll be floating somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have any notices motion. I don't see any presented. Uh, if you do, uh, you can bring it forward. Our next meeting date is scheduled for Thursday, July the 20th at 6 p.m. And Brian, uh, maybe you want to make a comment on Yeah, sorry, there was just, uh, Kelly just reminded me there. Uh, just while we have the committee here, I wanted to introduce uh, Davina, who's at the, the end of her line here. Uh, Davina Seo's uh, our new policy planner, just started at the start of this week, so she's uh, four days in and s still here. So 
That's a good sign. Um, <laughs> she we, had we had lunch today, so maybe that's why she stayed. <laughs> I'm not sure. But yeah, no, she's very welcome to, to the city. A good, a great addition to her staff, and we look forward to working with her. I should also mention Jed. Jed's sitting there being very quiet. Um, Jed's not new, but he's, he's, I think it's the right, first yeah. time he's been to the committee. Jed Snyder uh, works with Public Works Department, and he's one of our project coordinators. So he's one of the staff that reviews all of the engineering uh, um, uh, inputs and uh, submissions to the city. and. Uh, gives us our comments for our reports. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. And I, I want to thank staff and everyone. And there's a, a few attendees still here, but normally our planning meetings don't last this long. We're usually maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes, Correct. but at least we have to give everybody a say, and hopefully and we, we can we try to resolve things, and, and we don't always make everybody happy, I guess, but that's part of politics, too. But uh, anyway, thanks, Some, everybody. Sometimes we aren't very happy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You want to pound your head against the wall some days. But anyway, thank you very much for your attendance and thanks for your help. Adjournment uh, moved by Gerard and second by Dave. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>